it show. Attend, O oh reader, our tale of wonder. Welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. Uh, last time we got a little ways farther through Wheelers and found out that uh, th the city has intentionally been uh, causing trouble for the Wheelers, uh, trying to stop their biggest project, the repository, also known as Project 451. Essentially, uh, they want to send a bunch of information about how to live outside the uh, copyright strike system that this sis that this city has built. Um, and of course, the city is very upset about that. And uh, the author has done a absolutely fantastic job of uh, portraying like kind of the almost ideological journey of Dana as she has gone through, you know, starting to live with the wheelers and the people who are willing to be much more solar punk about things. So, you know, that's fun. I forgot to do something. I clicked record and I forgot to do something. These are going to be mildly annoying noises for a few moments here, and I sincerely apologize for that. Oh, I woke up library. Sorry, buddy. I know, Dad is so mean to wake you up. This is gonna be real loud for a second, gang. I need you to plug your ears for about 10 seconds. Much less loud than I thought it was gonna be, but it still probably was kind of loud and unplugged. And for that, I apologize. I'm just interacting with the mic real quick here. I forgot to. I forgot to apply my. Oh, my treatment. So the microphone does not echo quite so darn bad. See, it's very simple. I just take a little blanket. And I pin it over top of the microphone, and it soaks up a bunch of noise. Because, you know, sometimes sometimes you have to be wizard about it. And sometimes, sometimes it just works. Oh, okay. Last thing, and then we can properly get started and find out just what's going on in here. Last we left off. As I recall, uh, Dana had just met up with Dr. Quincy, uh, who wanted to go on a date, and, uh, oh no, they were going on a date, okay. Uh, yeah, he just got out of quarantine. Okay, that's where we were. Let's resume, shall we? She saw him as she rode up to their meeting spot. As she steered, she couldn't help but glance about. There was no sign of anyone else in any direction at all. This was the first time that they had total privacy. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, Dana got her own little electric motorcycle. I think that's everything, yeah. She slid the bike to a whisper-quiet halt beside him and shook, his ha shook her hair free of the helmet when she suddenly got a look at him. Doc, don't take this the wrong way, but you look awful. What would the right way be? Morris was learning against uh, Morris was leaning against his own bike a little too heavily to be casual. I was Ugh, just at the Ugh. Oh no. Those fake yawns made me kinda have to yawn. Ugh. See, that last one was real. <laughs> anyway, Dana didn't even think about it when she reached out and rested her fingers over his cheek gently. There were huge dark circles under his eyes. The outbreak you went to was at the Eastern Freeholds. That's more than a day's ride from here. And this, after tending to the outbreak itself, without much in the way of medical staff to help you, when was the last time you slept? He actually had to think about it. Doc, you should have said something. These bikes are fast and light. You doze off and hit a bump, you'd have killed yourself. I'm fine. I just wanted to see you. 
Yeah, and I'm sure you're seeing three of me right now, Dana returned, giving him a tight hug anyway. His exhaustion was even more obvious as she felt his weighted posture. He was sinking on his feet. I'm not kidding, Morris. When did you last take a full day without working or riding? He was about to answer when both their devices suddenly squawked. Weather event. Extreme low temperature. Dana swore under her breath. Of all the timing, she pulled up the wheeler map. Got any ideas? There's no nearby shelters on the map. Shelter from cold isn't about keeping the cold out, it's about keeping your warm thin. Morris yawned again, even under such conditions. I've got a survival tent. It'll be tight, but with both of us it'll be enough it'll be warm enough to survive the night. How are we going to keep warm? Dana quipped, but her breath was already misting. The temperature was plummeting quick. She could hear the air slowing down. Up above, the wind was making the clouds hurtle across the sky. The setting sun seemed paler, as though it couldn't quite reach them. Morris unpacked his tent, and they hurried to raise it. She laid her bike flat against the anchor points as the wind picked up fiercely. Dana was stunned at how fast it had come on, the cold slicing through her jacket like it wasn't there, as they covered over the bikes with project protective drop cloths. Morris took a moment to remove the fuel cells and bring them into the tent. Cold affects battery life. Best if we don't strand ourselves out here. Dana laid the sleeping bag along the floor of the tent as insulation against the cold ground below them. They both huddled together. The tent was small, meant for one person making a journey back and forth between the projects. The material was strong and durable, able to stand up to the weather, though the walls of the tent shook and flapped wildly against the wind. Dana nearly curled into the fetal position at the sound, agonizing at the wind being so close to devouring her at last. It was bad enough in the rig, let alone, well, we're actually out in the wind. I know what you mean. Took me a while to get used to it, too. Come here. Morris yawned with his eyes drooping. There was little room with two of them inside, but she didn't mind getting cozy with him. If it wasn't for the wind trying to reach into the tent and murder her with every gust, she'd almost have been comfortable. Morris, moving slowly, pulled a survival pack out of his bag and pushed it at her. Light the candle. And Dana fiddled through the pack and found a candle, handmade, about five inches long. Put it in a cup or something. Save the wax. There's someone that remelts it and makes new candles that way. Dana lit the candle and did so, and he pointed to the walls. It'll ice over. There are air vents designed for that, but you gotta check them or we'll suffocate if we're iced in. I'll keep watch. How long? Heat waves keep you down until sunset. Who knows how long this'll last? Not for too long. Weather hasn't been stable for more than a few hours since. He was snoring before he got to the end of his sentence, his body knowing what it needed the second he lay down. Despite herself, she felt a wave of affection for him. She'd seen him at parties, she'd seen him take charge over a patient, full of rapid-fire commands. She'd never seen him exhausted before, though. The wind howled again outside, and Dana heard the walls of the tent give a creaking noise. Frost was building up on the outer layer outside, and the soft tent material was starting to harden like thick cardboard. Within the tent, the air was misting as they breathed, but the candle put out a surprising amount of warmth, and so did the two of them. Morris shivered in his sleep, too tired to wake when his teeth chattered. Dana pulled a survival blanket out of his kit and laid it over them both, wrapping him up in her arms. Sleep well, babe. I'll keep you safe and warm. There's only one bed. I just realized this counted as this. There's only one bed. <laughs> anyway, the comment was the last thing she said for a while as he finally rested. The feeling of protectiveness made her fear the wind suddenly go away, and she settled in, comfortably. It suddenly occurred to her that she hadn't had this in a long time. People in the city were meticulous in avoiding contact. It was considered an investment in escaping medical expenses. The shelter had no privacy or no personal space at all. People crammed in it beyond all hope. Dana relaxed into the moment, reveling in the feeling of being warm and comfortable as an icy windstorm raged mere inches over her head. Rage on, Stormy. You can't touch us in here. Morris woke sleepily a few hours later. He didn't pull away, humming gratefully at the warmth. Mm, 
Best feeling in the world when being warm when it's cold out. I agree. To answer your question, we're fine. Neither of us are running a fever or have low body temperatures. You've been asleep for almost three hours. Not exactly the date I had planned. I don't know. I'm enjoying myself, she admitted lightly, pulling his face a little deeper into her neck. I've still got my lunch, if you don't mind eating in that sleeping bag. I'll brave it. I'm starving, actually. No surprise, but you needed sleep first. And I'm betting you haven't slept in a while. You probably haven't eaten, either. That's probably true. Doctors always make the worst patients, you know. Was it bad? The outbreak? Not bad, just intensity. Morris seemed surprised by the question. Some of the most miserable illnesses aren't life-threatening, just time-consuming. Three dozen people all down with Langford's malady. Symptoms are a lot like dysentery. She groaned. God, I can't imagine. They needed nursing more than doctoring, but I had to find the source or it'd happen again a week later. Tracked it back to some food that hadn't been served, preserved properly or prepared safely. Almost a week going back and forth between bedpans trying to keep people hydrated. Dana squeezed her eyes shut. Such a glamorous, noble profession is medicine. Tell me about it. I wanted to thank you for those letters. They were, they were like a life preserver. Well, sure, if you compare my letters to 50 people with dysentery, I'm sure they were great. <laughs> Dana scoffed, and Boris laughed despite himself. Seriously, though, after we eat, you should really get some more sleep. If you've been burning the candle at both ends for two or three days, a catnap won't get you far. If the things I'm hearing about the next few days are right, you're going to need your wits about you. I'll be fine, I'll be fine. I'm not asking, Doc. Odds are good that people will need a doctor soon. We need you rested and fed. Cold means you have no choice in the matter. Morris sighed, surrendering. After we eat, then thanks for looking after me. He looked up at her while she tried to say something demure and playful and kissed her sweetly before she could get the words out. Morris had made an effort to make it a romantic picnic date, bringing a satchel of real cheese and a, lo and a small loaf of nut bread something that paired well with honeyed berries from Dana's supply. The two of them ate until the food was gone. With the tent warm enough to be comfortable, the candle was like curling up in front of the fireplace. The honey was sweet and decadent, and Dana couldn't help rolling the flavor around her mouth again. Do you believe in God, Morris? Well, not for a while. Why do you ask? I was thinking about something my brother said to me a few months ago, about how all enjoyments considered frivolous to statics, but... It wasn't always like that. There was a time before the city, before any city, in fact. I wonder about those days pre-collapse. There's a god, and he made the world, and everything I need to know about him is in the trees and honey. She was gearing up to make the same speech she'd given Yana. She suddenly wished desperately that he'd been there. She never poured out so much of her heart in front of people before. She wanted to hear him. She wanted him to hear what she'd said. Or... She wanted to know if he approved or agreed. Maybe he, if he could match it with something and show her as much as she'd sh shown the Arcadian leadership. And yet it wasn't necessary. Somehow Morris knew what she was feeling without her having to make any kind of speech at all. <clears throat> I admit, back home they seem to have forgotten something fundamental about being human. He relaxed into her comfortably. She settled in closer to him, breathing in his warm, clean smell. This tent is pretty far from civilization, but this is the most humid I've felt for a long time. Me too. He kissed her hands as she stroked her fingers over his face luxuriantly. Pleased, Dana pushed him back until he lay with his head in her lap, and she produced the music player she'd swiped from his pocket, looking for something more mellow than the concert trio. Maybe this is what human civilization was always meant to be, he murmured softly, half in a dream. Just people who care about each other, keeping away the cold, dark world outside. In a tent, in a cave, in a tower. No matter. Just this. Just this, Data agreed, and kissed him again. The wind had blown itself out while they slept. They had some water left, but neither of them were in a hurry. Their devices had said that the weather had broken safe, broken enough for safe travel, but the weather outside was still cold enough they preferred to stay where they were. 
what you said about the other night, the, how I haven't taken a full day without working or traveling in too long. He challenged her. What about you? I admit I've always had something to do since leaving the city, or at least something to work on. New ideas, new places. This is my first real day off. Doesn't matter. I work slower, more patient out here. Well, it is for the most part, but humans need leisure time. Time when it's not all scramble to get something done. Time when we're not exhausting ourselves. When we imagine things, sit and read, learn a new, a new idea, make a considered plan, make connections to others. Is that what we're calling it? They both laughed as they ate the rest of their food. We'll have to go soon. It's too bad. Did you ever go back to the city, Dana? Weather making you nostalgic for those concrete walls? It was a lazy, comfortable, sleepy sort of weekend they'd had. She'd happily have stayed there forever. Not that exactly. I'm just wondering how this plays out long term. Whether your brother's, whatever your brother's got cooking at the maker's meet, I get the feeling it's something big. Back when we first met, I made, you made no secret of wanting to go back to the city. I just, well, I was wondering if things are different now. Her fingers stilled in his hair as if waiting for him to finish that thought somehow. Different? Wondering if this can last much longer. Would you like this to keep going? She asked, curling her fingers around his neck again, enjoying the way he hummed and pulled a little closer. Because our whole thing has been done in bits and pieces. Most of our conversations have been by correspondence or video conference. He reached up and cupped her cheek, tugging her gently and slowly for him to a kiss. I want this to keep going, he said quietly, making a solemn oath. Assembling bits and pieces into something real is how they do everything out here. Why not relationships while we're at it? Dana licked her lips, tasting the last traces, traces of honey from his kiss. I'm not going back to the city, she said, and then she froze. Huh. First time I ever said that out loud. He looked at her. He looked up at her, unreadable. You're certain? He said. It didn't sound like a question, but... It was clear he was doubting himself. <sighs> yes, nobody ever pay attention to baby Kitty. Mm -hmm. Dad's so busy, he type Kitty all day, and then he sit down and read. No time to pet baby Kitty. Can you guys believe it? The poor little man, bereft of attention. For context, uh, I am giving Magnus the go, because I, I could have been petting him all day, but he is just now bothering me now that I am in the middle of something. But, you know, that's the way it is. What? You want to come sit on my lap? That'd be a great spot for baby kitty. I could pet you while I'm reading if you did. He says, no, I want to sit right here. Yeah. Nobody never pet the baby. Never, ever. Poor kitty. Okay, Kit Kat. You stay put. We're reading. Where was I? Ah. Dana was about to say it again and see what she could do to be convincing when her device chimed again. She had to tie her limbs in a knot to get the screen out without dislodging him, but she got there and pulled the screen to where they could both see it. The map had been updated with an immediate alert. Top priority. Makers meet. The location followed. It was only an hour or two away by motorcycle. Pay attention to Magnus. All right, I got an idea. Come here, Kitty. Come here. Come here. Sit on Dad's lap. He's like, I did not want to be picked up. We've discussed this. Yeah. Nobody never pay attention to the Kitty. Can you believe it? Poor little man. Yeah, that's what I thought. 
The location followed. It was only an hour or two away by motorcycle. This is it. If the city does have agents in Arcadia, they're calling it in right now. Morris sighed and craned his neck up to kiss her again. Guess date night is over, such as it was. He caught her hand as they both packed their blankets away. Dana, thank you. Thank you for taking care of me. I could have happily stayed like this for a week. Me too, she said, feeling like she'd just taken some kind of vow. Maybe we can even do it again when this is all over. I get the feeling we'll all want some quiet time when it's finished. For your brother, it's over when the repository is launched. For me, it's over when everyone's healthy. But if you can wait an extra day or two for me... I think I can arrange that. Dana slid open the entrance to the tent. The shock of cold air that poured in made them both gasp. There was a crack... There was a cracking, creaking noise as the layer of ice was forced to move. It was thicker than Dana expected, but they broke their way out anyway. The whole plane was shining brightly like a blanket of diamonds. There was little water in the air, but it had crystallized against every available surface as frost. The ground crunched as Dana made her way back over to the motorcycle, plugging the power cell in. Check every moving part. If anything's ice solid, we'll find out at the worst possible time when we start moving. He pulled his bike up, and Dana heard a cracking noise come from it. He checked, swore under his breath. Like mine, for instance. Looks like the frame froze solid and got brittle. Guess I'm driving, she chirped. Dana had taken the driver's seat of her motorcycle, and Morris sat behind her, reporting that the summons on their devices was being updated with warnings and details of the project. The design for the printers would be provided when they arrived. When everyone gets there, they'll be told what to build. Dean's bringing everyone else. We can make copies of the repository as we go. That part's purely digital. Your brother chose a, uh, your brother chose a spot where the prevailing winds can take the repository over the city walls. Uh, what happens if it works? I don't know. My father once said if you want to make enemies, all you have to do is try and change things. Glad he never met my father. He thinks people who change things are the worst enemies. Dana was about to answer when they came over the dunes and got a clear look ahead. Dana idled her bike to a halt alongside Morris, both of them taking it in. Dana had been only to one maker's meet before, at the Miller's scrapyard. That was a routine day, with everyone using the facilities to carry out their day-to-day -day needs. This was the first one that summoned people together to work on a single project. Dana got the feeling it didn't happen very often. It was three times the size of the barn raising that, gathers a few, that gathered a few days before. A year ago, Dana would have been in disbelief at how many wheelers there were. Six months before, she would have been struggling with the feeling of unworthiness, paralyzed by all the things she didn't know how to do in comparison to the lifelong Arcadians. But now, she looked at the gathering, and all she could see was the flames at Miller's scrapyard and the blood at Suresh's salt mine. There's gotta be a reason, she murmured doggedly. For? Morris asked, looking across the assembly himself. The Fringers. Banner's right. They'll hit this place with everything they've got if they can get here in time. I believe it. I've seen them do it, but I can't figure out why. Dana was gripped by fury for a moment. There's no profit in this th for them, nothing but the expense of sending an attack in the first place. But they're willing to kill. They're expending resources to do it. Why? What fear does Arcadia hold? What rage are they creating in Crawley? What do they do wrong? Morris looked sick. We better get down there. The meat looked like a large collection of vehicles from the outside. As they rode in, Dana could see the organization that all wheeler assemblies seemed to have. The printer farms were already operational, the microgrid and power cells linked together for large-scale power generation. There was no food being laid out this time, no effort expended on a relaxed pace or a comfortable gathering. They all knew how serious this was. Dana scanned for her brother and found him at a large table that had several devices and computer terminals networked together. Dean was making copies of the repository, and Banner was with him. Dana stowed her bike and strode over to him, Morris at her side, or Morris at her heels, rather, when they both saw Marco come running over with a, a tray of data cards. You were meant to be back on your way to the freehold, Morris barked at the boy. Dana jumped. She'd never heard Morris bark that way at anyone, let alone an apprentice. 
Even so, she was reacting the same way. It's all hands on deck, Doctor, Banner fired back before Marco could speak. I wanted the children out of here too, but we need everyone who can help. I'm not that helpful yet, Dana shook the thought off. How long till we can scatter? I'm not confident. I've already called Yena, and she's agreed to scale back the launch to a hundred. Even so, we're entirely too close to the red line for my liking. Our lookouts are spread thin. Dana bit her lip. I'll go, she offered, ignoring the sharp look from Dean and Morris. I've got faster wheels than any of the makers, and I'm the only one here that doesn't have a printer or a lifetime of technical experience. I'm learning, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> Dean put in. Freya came over, apparently close enough to hear. Give her the jammers. Banner led her over to his rig, which was parked closest to them. We've been assembling these while we drove here. We're assuming the city will send an attack that when, when they see so many of us gathered from their recon flights. Maybe even satellite passes, if there are any up there from the old days. But the attack itself will likely be combat drones. Those craft are remote controlled, pilots back at the city. Banner reached into his rig's door and pulled out a gizmo. It was a metal pole with a spike on one end and an antennae on the other. These are broad spectrum signal jammers. They'll be able to disrupt any signal going long distance. Got a range of almost of a almost a kilometer. Drone comes within a click of these, and it'll fall right out of the sky. Morris went closer, taking a look. How many do you have? Here at the meet, ten. Four have been deployed, but until you got here, we only had one motorcycle, so they aren't back yet. Other wheels are the rigs, and all they're, they're all part of the meet. Don't want to be here any longer than we have to be, but the thing is, military-grade combat drone has an ordinary ra ordnance range of more than two kilometers. Pilots can eyeball it. So we've got to go get those jammers out at least two kilometers from the meet. I'm on it. Going with you, Boris said quickly. That far out, we don't have enough jammers to make an unbroken barrier. We've got enough to build a defensive line covering one direction. We know where the nearest drone fleet's likely based. Why don't you have jammers at all your outposts? Dana asked, remembering the swarm of attack drones that had circled the valleys while she could do nothing but watch from a safe distance. Block all signals, we lose our comms too. Which means if the lookouts see an attack coming, we won't be able to call it in. He searched through storage and produced a flare gun. You have to use that. See anything that's not us? Send up a flare. He waved over his partner, who was nearly bent double under the weight of all the tools he was carrying around the meat. Banner selected a sledgehammer and passed it to Morris. We need that too. So why don't you want me doing this? Dana asked her brother, who was still frowning. At time. The whole reason we're sending out these jammers is because we're expecting resistance. If the jammers work, then any drone pilot will have to eyeball a shot before the signal is disrupted. Which means whoever plants these things is going to be the most likely target, since everything else will be behind our defensive line. Morris summed up, glancing at Dana. Two on a bike means someone can keep the engine running and the lookout watching, ready to retreat at a moment's notice while the jammers are planted. Dana looked out over the huge assembly, then sent a glance up at the sky as if she could see the enemy watching. Yana's right. This is like drawing a bullseye. By now they know if they're looking. The 451's drawing a lot of fire, and it can't be allowed to take another year to finish. If we can get the whole thing launched and... If finished and launched before the city can organize their drone fleet, we better hurry. The longer these people are gathered without jammers. Quite right. Move with purpose, people. Dean gave Dana a quick look. I don't want you to go. You'll have the most exposed position. You and Freya can't go. You're the ones in charge of the project. I'm better than I used to be, but you need the A-team for a rust job. Uh, driving a motorcycle out is something I can do. She kissed his cheek quickly. Don't dawdle. The faster you finish, the safer we all are. As she hurried back toward the motorcycle, she glanced at Morris. You could stay if there's an attack, which we all know is getting increasingly more likely. Uh, the doctor should probably stay close. Morris hesitated and shook his head. I don't. I don't want you. Uh, I don't want you alone up there. Besides, we know the perimeter is the most dangerous spot for this. And might as well take a doctor along. Most Arcadian construction was either protected by natural formations like the valleys or camouflage like Xanadu Station. The Maker's Meet 
had no such protection. It was the first time Dana had heard of such deliberate defenses, let alone helped install them. Morris had a bundle of four jammers, and Dana drove them speedily out across the open. Here and there she saw the scrub of wild grasses, finding places to live, even out in, am in amongst the arid rocks. The thought made her smile. She'd been living in Arcadia's work in progress for almost a year, and now that she'd seen what the finished product would be like, she could hardly stand to wait. It might not happen in my lifetime, but it'll keep going. Dana checked the map on her device to find the correct range and skidded the bike to a halt, keeping it idling as Morris slid off the back, drawing one of the jammers and spearing it in a hard pan. Dana didn't stop scanning before she unslugged the sled sledgehammer and held it out to him. They were right. Two people on a bike was the only way it's going to work. Morris hammered the jammer into the ground so it would stay upright and switched it on. All right, next one goes kilometer that way. Oh. It took almost an hour to finish the defensive line. Dana kept watching the skies, waiting for the strike to come but the sky remained clear for as far as they could see. You're still convinced an attack's coming? Dana didn't look in, her, look in his direction, eyes scanning. I am. We've, I've been seeing nothing but escalation since that first balloon came over the wall, and we're about to launch a hundred. Morris checked his clock. To make a hundred copies of the data will only take a few minutes. To manufacture a hundred versions of that cargo capsule, and it depends on how long they've been planning this. Divisional labor isn't a new trick for Arcadia. To assemble the thing and launch them might take an hour if they put everyone on it. You knew, Morris murmured, not exactly an accusation. You knew they were launching it today. I didn't tell you because, well, that's how wheelers protect themselves, but one way or another this could be over in an hour or two. They both returned their gaze to the horizon, waiting for the counterattack. The two of them kept watch when Morris suddenly pointed back at the meat. Look. Dana looked. The repositories were launching. First one, then three, then dozens. The balloons lifted off the ground, floating more or less straight up until they caught the wind and started floating in the direction of the red line. Dana let out a wild laugh, her breath steaming instantly. She'd only ever seen one of these weather balloons before. Seeing dozens in multi-bright colors was almost better than a fireworks display. She could see the capsules beneath, each holding their cargo protectively, ready for delivery to whoever found them first. Morris looked down to see Dana holding his hand. He couldn't help the smile. Well, he said, unable to think of anything else. The balloons were already looking small in the sky. You're moving fast, probably already two or three clicks away. The two of them watched the launches float silently toward the city, and the furthest one burst into flames. Dana dropped his hand, scampering forward a step, as if she could save it. What? Then another burst of flame, and another, and another. The repositories were being shot down. Dana put the scope to her eye again. Drones, I think. I can barely see them, but they're coming to the launch head-on, so they're flying against the wind. Morris had already pointed the flare gun at the sky and fired. We gotta move. They knew... Dana breathed, following him to the bike. They knew we were launching today. We didn't even know that until we got here. They didn't send an attack on the meat because they decided to wait out of our range for the balloons. Big, slow targets for combat drones. Morris suddenly pointed. Look. In the setting sun, it was hard to see the row of vehicles coming over the dunes at unsafe velocities. If Dana didn't recognize them from the life, her life in the city, she certainly did from the attack on the salt mine. Fringers, she rasped in horror, suddenly unable to breathe. They aren't sending drone attacks, they're sending troops. Our jammers can't block a human soldier with a gun. The Fringer vans were splitting up in a rush. There were enough of them to, take a, to make a perimeter. Dana had to spin the bike back and forth between the dust dunes and caught what happened next in pieces. She saw some of the rigs making a break for it, with Fringers firing after them, but not giving chase. She saw more Fringers in riot gear forming a barricade before the wheelers could get past them, firing their weapons at the motionless rigs. Get to the radio, she thought wildly. 
Get to the radio, she thought wildly. Call Crawley. Tell him to call it off. By the time Dana got closer, the Fringers had fired canisters of thick tear gas, and the Wheelers had responded with smoke can canisters, both weapons concealing the area. The setting sun didn't help, but Dana got a glance at the perimeter they were setting up. The Fringers weren't rushing the smoke. They were getting ready to take prisoners. The bike was battery-powered, and the wheels spinning were the only part of the vehicle that made any noise. Dana cut the power and rolled them in when, she, when they got close to the smoke. Watch for the difference between smoke and gas, Morris warned as he slid off the bike and pulled his medical bag off the front. Dana crept forward enough to see one of the parked rigs. There, rather, Dana crept forward enough to see around one of the parked rigs. She caught a glimpse of fringers working in teams of two or three. They were forcing the doors on all the vehicles, clearing them out of people. She saw several rigs already burning up, sending more smoke over everything. She saw the familiar face of Magnus the Big Spender, her semi-acquaintance since she'd left home, running to the fringers, waving, to his, waving his hands to get attention. Why is Magnus running toward them? Before she could follow that thought, she suddenly saw Banner dragging a motionless body into some cover. Banner nearly took a swing at her, on instinct, as she crept up behind him, but he let out a breath once he saw her and Morris sneak into his hiding place. Morris went, went right to work on the injured man Banner had been dragging along. Banner pulled back to let him work. Your flare helped, but we couldn't get clear in time. We were expecting drones. All our defenses were for that. Smoke grenades to hide sight lines, reflective tape to block laser and radar guidance. None of it does a thing against human eyes. Dana nodded quickly. The majority of them are forcing all the wheelers to stay in this one area. Looks like they were hoping for a smaller net. They're pretty irregularly spaced, but they're not coming in. Not all in force, anyway. So they're scattered, too. Now they wait for the smoke and the gas to clear. Banner nodded, rubbing his bloodshot eyes. We can hide for a few more minutes, but we can't run. Where's Dean? Trying to get the others mobile again, last I saw. Banner hissed as he tended to his own scrapes. Hit our rigs first. Dean and Frey are trying to get the survivors and the ones that still work. If we can get our people away from the troops, well, they've still got aerial drones. Maybe we can get a radio. Tell them there's civilians here. Morris was working feverishly. I can't leave the wounded. That's your job, Morris. Do what you can, but remember, priority's getting them away from here. He was about to leave their hiding place and go join the fight when he paused and set a glance back at Dana. Repositories? <clears throat> the repositories? They didn't make it. They kept the drones at the edge of our jammer range. They knew they couldn't get closer, so they waited for the big, slow targets to launch. Gotta make sure the Fringer vehicles can't give chase, Banner said seriously, looking to see if the way was clear. Dana reached into Morris's medical bag and pulled out a roll of bandages, wrapping them around her nose and mouth quickly as an impromptu gas mask. I have to find Dean, and before you say it, I know that's the opposite direction, but I've got to try. Good luck. To us all. Under the smoke and gas, the twilight was almost full dark. Dana was creeping towards the printers. Dean and Freya would likely be there. As she moved, she got a look at the battlefield. The wheelers had been splitting up, trying to run when the net closed in. As a result, there wasn't so much a fight as several small skirmishes spread out. Few of the wheelers carried weapons, but they all had gear and tricks to escape notice and capture. Only a few Fringers were inside the zone, actively fighting. There was plenty of smoke, plenty of damage, but very few bodies. Dana saw a few familiar faces as she went. Some of them were captured, some of them were bloodied. The printers had already been trashed, but Dana knew her brother had a smaller one of his own and snuck her way over to Freya's rig, trying not to be noticed by either side. Dean was there, his printer still running as he worked the controls quickly. When he saw Dana, he froze, waving for her to duck. The printer wasn't loud, but it was going to draw attention soon enough. I saw Banner. He says to... I heard. His instructions went out to everyone with one of our comms. Frey is already rounding up the survivors. He gestured to the printer. I'm using our less natural toolkit right now. You tie the right equipment to our antennae, and we can max out the fringe earpieces, like setting off a stun grenade in their ears. He pulled the latest creation off the printer and assembled it quickly. 
Take that to Freya, then go with her. He was tapping at the controls again. I'm making another one. The more directions we go, the better. Dana felt hyper-aware. She felt like she could hear the roaches scuttling in the dirt. Dana found Freya had already been captured. Four people, including Freya, were being guarded by two fringers with machine guns. With the majority of the fringers rushing to hound, round up the Arcadians before they could escape, those who had been captured already were being guarded by smaller numbers. Dana was trying to figure out how to get around two armed guards when she suddenly spotted Marco. The boy was smaller and faster than any adult, and he'd apparently crept through the wreckage rather than go around. Marco was creeping toward Freya when one of the guards spotted him. Hey! Marco turned and bolted back the way he'd come, through the debris. From her vantage point, D Dana could see his escape route, but the two guards couldn't. One of the guards fired a spray of bullets after Marco on instinct, and then gave chase when he heard the footstep footsteps rushing away. You got it? I got it, the other guard promised, and stayed with the prisoners, while his partner ran after Marco, trying to figure out which way he'd gone in the smoke. One guard, Dana thought, sneaking forward, feeling like she was going to be shot any second. One guard with a machine gun. Yeah, this cannot possibly be my life. All of you put your faces in the dirt, the guard was saying to his prisoners, and Dana felt a thrill go through her when she heard his voice. You're only guard at the moment, so don't make me nervous. Your hands are tied, anyone tries to take advantage of the moment, and I start shooting. Dana rose from her hiding place and strode over, pulling her mask down. Put the gun away, Eli. The guard spun, the rifle coming up fast. Eli was masked, but she was right about his voice, and he nearly dropped his gun in shock when he saw her. Did Dana? Surprised to see me? Dana looked over to Eli's sh looked over Eli's shoulder, then quickly returned her gaze to him, eye to eye. She'd seen Marco creeping out of the smoke towards Freya. She kept eye contact with Eli, daring him not to break it first and notice. In fact, with the gas mask and helmet, his eyes were all she could see. So, I guess you finally graduated from trainee, huh? She said harshly. You're now at the shooting unarmed people rank? We're defending the city from criminals and subversives. It's the job description. I want to know, where are the other weapons? What other weapons? This isn't an army, it's a work party. Working on weapons. Eli was in shock at seeing her, forgetting the prisoners completely. They already launched dozens of them. Don't you know what happening? Don't you know what's happening here? Don't you? Dana willed herself not to look towards Marco. The boy was cutting Freya free. The launch wasn't a weapon, Eli. I know because I was there when we built it. But what was it? Eli demanded when he heard scuffling as the four prisoners ran. He spun and was aiming before he could register what he was shooting at. No! Dana didn't even think, darting forward and putting a hand under his gun, setting the bullets spraying upwards. Eli was still staring after Marco. He's a kid. Why are there children here? Because this isn't an enemy camp. Have you seen one gun, one missile? I could have killed him. I could have killed a kid. Eli was frozen, paralyzed between what he, would, what he had been told and what he was seeing with his own eyes. Dana could sympathize with the paradox, but didn't have time. Freya was on her feet again, letting the others free. Dana tossed her the device Dean had printed before Eli could react, but he swung the gun around again. Freya led the other prisoners quickly into the smoke while Dana wrestled over the gun for a moment with Eli. Eli successfully put her into the dirt, the gun swinging after the prisoners, then back to her, then to the smoke as if he could still see them. Eli, I know it's been a while, and I know you've been told differently, but you have to trust me right now. Dana said, seriously, carefully getting back to her feet, very aware of the gun still aiming at her. We're not the bad guys in this story. We? I've got orders to bring you in. All our, our orders say no exceptions. Probably had eyes on the scene since you all got together. He confirmed there were no civilians, nothing but hostile targets. That include me? If you have to shoot me, then do your job, Fringer. With a bravery she didn't feel, Dana stared him down. The moment hung between them for almost five seconds, till more fringers came running out of the smoke carrying zip ties. We're the prisoners. Eli was about to answer when all of them suddenly yelled in shock, doubling over in agony, ripping at their ears. Every fringer had an earpiece, and all of them were under masks and headgear, so pulling the earpieces out wasn't a simple task. 
Dana could hear the ear-splitting squall from two feet away. She took advantage, scrambling into the smoke. The baker's meat was in flames and ruins, but she had still walked this area only a few hours before. She found the bike in short order, right where Morris had left it. Dana scanned around, looking for the nearest antennae. Sure enough, Freya was close by, turning up the volume on the static attack. Dean was across from her, herding people onto his rig. Banner had organized his people into a counterattack, taking advantage of the few moments when the fringers were herding, his people wrestling guns away. Even under such circumstances, Dana noticed the wheelers weren't shooting, shooting at the fringers, instead provi providing suppressing fire until they could get the wounded into the rigs that still worked. One or two were shooting at the fringer trucks, firing into their wheels and engines. Dana gunned the throttle and turned the bike to the west and rode full speed toward the jammers. She wasn't the only Arcadian to make it that far. A few of them had already been collected, and the wheelers gave her a wave as she powered along the road, looking for an unclaimed one. She found it and levered it out of the ground as quickly as she could, keeping it switched on. Get to the radio and warn them there are children down here. Brilliant plan, except Crawley already knew that, she thought bleakly. Dana rode back into the smoke, looking for her brother's rig. He was already moving, powering towards the perimeter. Away from the smoke and gas, the rigs were suddenly visible, and the circling drones above started picking targets. Dean slowed the rig to a relative stop, just long enough for Dana to abandon the bike and climb aboard. Once the door was shut, Dean gunned the rig into high speed and hit the controls to bring down the Machito shutters, shutters. The rig sealed up, still moving, and Dana heard bullets peppering against the metal as they forced their way through the perimeter. Dean let the shutters up again, and Dana caught a glimpse of the fringers preparing to give chase. They're faster than us. Kill the jammer, Marco said to her, spookily calm. The child was so certain that Dana did so without asking why. As soon as it was off, Dean's device, mounted in its customary spot on the dashboard, came to life, but Marco wasn't looking at it. He had a small recon drone, but now it had several short printed spines sticking off its top. He tossed it out the window and took quick control of it. Dana watched the drone out the window. Under the weight of the additions, it could barely stay airborne, but Marco was a skilled pilot and flew it straight to the nearest Fringer van, which was giving chase to them. She didn't see what happened, but the Fringer van flipped over like it had run into a landmine. Spike traps for the wheels, charge drones for the vehicle engines, jammers and smoke grenades for the troops. Dean grinned from the driver's seat. Turn the jammer back on. Their attack drones won't be able to shoot, and sooner or later, we'll be outside their range. Without their wheels, the fringers can't hurt us. As if to answer him, a stray bullet took one of his rearview mirrors off. Well, not for long, anyway, he added grimly as he drove faster. Dana, still buzzing from the adrenaline, finally letting herself feel the panic, looked back at the rig, crammed with bloodied, tear-gassed, smoke-stained people. We had enough for a hundred rigs. A lot less are now driving away, she thought numbly. Banner was right. It's a war, and even a lie doesn't know why they're fighting. They drove around in circles until they were sure nobody was following, then they made their way to the others. The fifteen rigs that made it out were already setting up tents for the injured. The instant the doors opened, Banner swept in, breathing hellfire. He took in the whole rig and his eyes fixed on Dana for a moment of rage that made her breath catch. It passed quickly. Anyone that needs medical care head to the largest tent. We've got food and water waiting for the rest of you until we can find transports. Everyone off the rig. His tone was so sharp that everyone jumped. Dana was still holding her breath, but she followed the crowd. The second everyone was off the rig, she heard Banner smashing his way through Dean's home, tearing it into it, tearing into it ferociously. He was still keyed up for the fight and, apparently, taking out his frustrations on everything Dean owned. Should we stop him? Freya asked as she stood closer to Dean, nonplussed. Her rig had been lost, too. Okay, you first, Dean said, plainly, and Freya barked out a laugh despite herself. Everyone was still shaking from the straight-up war they barely escaped. Dana did a quick head count. Less than a third of the maker's meat was still free, and most of their printers had been destroyed. Banner swept out of the rig and pointed to Dana. Seize that woman! Dana felt hands grab her arms tightly, and she squawked. I saw you with that fringer! 
Banner barked at Dana, getting right in her face. He was practically ordering him around. A lie? I know him. He was a trainee when I left home. Dana responded with the truth automatically. He was told it was a staging area for an attack on the city. He couldn't figure out why there were kids at the meet. That's why he stopped. Banner, what are you doing? Dean roared, and the whole crowd was closing in. Dozens of sweaty, adrenaline-charged survivors pressing in close, trying to pull apart one side or the other, getting in each other's way. The math checks out. I suspected her for a reason. Banner started counting on his fingers, never taking his eyes off Dana. The scrapyard, the valleys, the workshops, they've all been hit. So, so have a dozen places she's never seen, and all those places she was, so were hundreds and hundreds of other people. I get that she's new, Banner. We gotta be careful of new people just like any other frontier group, but there's nothing that ties the attacks to her. Wondered why you would confess that Crawley approached you at all, Banner said with silky menace. Surely getting us looking would be the greater risk, but then I realized. With your brother, you could be well away from anywhere that attack from anywhere before an attack came. Kept us searching for all the statics that hadn't confessed. It was a brilliant move. Volunteering to put up defenses against drones kept you safe when they sent troops. So what? You said yourself, the math doesn't support a, a, the idea of a spy anymore. The city's hitting places where we gather. They could have spotted this on any recon flight. You said yourself, the drones can't be retasked as efficiently as human pilots. That alone sent, explains why they sent troops. She's got debts to pay in the city, sort of debts that make her very open to blackmail or recruitment. Dana genuinely scoffed at that one. So does every person alive back there. She's right, Banner. And even if she was working for them, how would she even get the chance to call it in? There's nothing to tie her to the fringers at all. Banner's face changed, and he played his ace. Yes, there is. Dana felt the hairs on the back of her neck stand up as Banner reached into his jacket and pulled out a familiar radio. Fringer issue, Dean. Found it in your rig. Dana couldn't help but look at Dean, who was truly shocked. He was looking at the radio to her, back to the radio, back to her. His face was pure disbelief. She hadn't seen that kind of expression on his face, not even when they were kids. He'd never been caught so off guard, not over anything. That's... that's not... Dean started to say, stopped himself, and tried again. That doesn't mean... He looked at Dana. It's not yours. I... I mean... I remember how it was. The Fringers are as much a threat to hungry people in the city as they are to anyone from Arcadia. You... you wouldn't. You'd never. He was trailing off every time he tried to say something in her defense, and Dana felt the knife twisting over and over. I'm sorry, Dean. I should have told you about it. Dean nearly fell down. Banner took it as a confession, which it pretty much was. She was... But she was reporting to them the whole time. Didn't need our networks to send any messages. Even as satellite uplink, she could have reported our people from anywhere. No! I never read it. I even checked it three times to see if it was another trick or a homing beacon or something. Check the same. Only thing it wor only way it works is if somebody puts the battery back in and turns it on. Since you were the only one who knew it was there, Banner glanced at Dean. Assuming you didn't know, you didn't tell anyone. Dana summoned all her impulse control not to look at Freya, who was notably silent during the whole accusation. I never used it. It was never switched on. Dana begged desperately. But I, I, I couldn't trash it. it. It's an infringement. Her voice turned thin as the truth proved more pathetic even to her ears. Please listen to me. But what can I say? That I always planned to leave, that the world was nothing but a homeless shelter on wheels until recently? That I was hiding a huge, possibly lethal secret from my brother for almost a year while he took me in? All those things were true. There was a numb, deathly silence. Banner turned to Dean and the other wheelers. She's been to Xanadu, she's stayed at the valley, she's been to headquarters, spoken to Yana. Oh, oh God. Dean's voice was choked with pure horror. And then, out of nowhere, a voice spoke up clearly. Banner, the radio isn't hers. Oh, okay. Banner, the radio isn't hers. Dead silence is the cir in the circle as Morris faced his way past people and stood beside Dana. 
Dana stared at Morris in disbelief, trying to figure out his plan. If you'll notice, she never once said it was her radio. She found it among her things only recently. Morris gave the lie casually and masterfully. Radio's mine, and you're right. It's Fringer issue. Took it with me when I left the city. I didn't know what, what I'd find when I first came out here. Kept it because I'm a doctor. Being able to contact people at long range, it's a basic necessity for me. Our network's secure, but it's a relay network. Figured satellite communication might be more reliable. He reached out and took the radio from Banner. For security's sake, I left it disabled when not in use, as you can see. Banner glared at him. It's yours. Why was it in this rig? Morris met his gaze head on. Why do you think? Don't use it all that often. Must have left, left it behind one night. Dana flushed automatically. As cover stories went, it was plausible. Her budding relationship with Morris certainly wasn't a secret. It's your radio, Banner repeated. He didn't believe it. Look, Freya spoke, finally. We've got almost a dozen wheelers here. Some of us know Dana well. Some of us haven't met her. She pointed back and forth between Dean and Banner. I dare say we've got two advocates here, for and against. Now you went and did it, Morris. Dana and Morris were not included in the discussion. They'd answered questions and been told to wait outside, under guard, while deliberations were made. For the most part, they just stood around at the edge of the tents. Their guards were watching, but not approaching or speaking to them. They didn't have a jail cell, but there was open wasteland for miles beyond them in every direction. Which was perfect, because Dana wanted a, pri wanted a private conversation. Why? Dana asked Morris in bewilderment. Why take the hit for me? Morris glanced over at their discreet guards. Told you that I came for money back in the city. If I had to start over, I could. You couldn't. I'm a doctor. I've seen those shelters. Seen what's left of attractive women after a few weeks in them. He turned to look at her. If I'm totally honest, I wanted to protect you, even if nothing... Oh. She rushed to speak. You were kind enough not to ask. I honestly forgot about it for a long time since I was... You don't need to convince me. You either have the worst possible poker face, in which case there's no problems, or you're so good at playing helpless I frankly deserve to be fooled. Freya came out of the conference and walked over to them. So the ruling. They're willing to accept this wasn't malicious, but the escalation of violence has people half convinced you're involved or at least being tracked somehow. To prove one way or another, the conclusion is we have to isolate you temporarily. We're being iced? Morris was unsurprised. Exile's the worst case scenario, Doc. This would be a form of probation, Freya said seriously. It's six months. If the attacks stop, then that might become permanent. If they continue to escalate, in six months you come back. Clean slate, you guys start over. Dana felt ill. Is start over, by which you mean from scratch. We both know reputation's the currency in Arcadia, where postings are concerned. The newcomers get left at a freehold. You never see anything else until their reputation's built up. You're, you're telling me if I can survive the wasteland for six months, I'll still never go back to the projects? Freya hesitated. We're working on that part. Dean's still pleading your case, but it's a hard sell, given that he apparently didn't know about the radio in his own rig for almost a year. Freya pulled the Fringer radio off her belt. Speaking of, take it with you. Whether Morris was telling the truth or not, none of us really want to keep it. Morris took the radio with due gravity. And if the city's tracking it somehow, it's best to get it away from you. Freya winced, but said nothing to that. You didn't turn me in, Dana said quietly. You're the only one I told about the radio. If you got caught covering for me, you'd get iced. Why? For Dean, Freya said seriously. As long as you keep that radio even dismantled, you still have one foot in your old life. That radio is your safety net. You kept it because it's military issue and destroying it is a costly infringement. Dana winced. That was why at first you kept it because if you ever go back, you have to return it. Return it. Any other reason is because you still think the Fringers are in the right. 
Freya growled harshly. Given that they just used tear gas on Marco, I'm not inclined to agree. Whatever your reasons are, you've kept that door open for almost a year. Now you got caught with your hand on the hand. I should have destroyed it months ago, but it stayed with the rig when I was at the projects, and most of the time I forgot about it. I had decided to destroy it, but now it's too late. Morris spoke softly. He'd been so quiet they'd almost forgotten him. That's for now. When did you, when did you decide to hold on to it? After the blast at Miller's, I, I wasn't sure yet. And after that, there was still one thing about my old life that Arcadia can't provide. History, memories. I mean, I don't mean happy memories or even important history. It's family history. My folks had to face retirement eventually. Dean left as soon as he was able. I'm the only one left. You understand. Dean was still tethered to the city, too, Freya nodded. By you. Banner had just made it a punishable offense to communicate with the city. If he'd done that a year ago, Dean wouldn't have been able to, to talk to you when you lost the house. I wouldn't have been there waiting for you when you passed the windbreaks. You'd still be in that shelter. If I was lucky. Even sacred historical things are just things, Dana. How many holy places were wiped out by the storms? How many people had favorite spots they'll never see again? You think I was raised in my rig? In my head, I know that. In my heart, I, I always thought I'd be leaving that house to my own kids. And then one day, they'll be unable to keep up with the fees. They'd have to flee the city for a year or two, just like you. Freya was immovable. After you found your place here, you had plenty of chances. Dean was behind the wheel every day. All you had to do was toss it out the window. I know. But by then, everyone was convinced a war was coming. I thought if maybe I had a hotline to Crowley, then... Maybe I could... Could what? Tell him there were children being targeted? He knew that already. I get that now. Stop defending them. I should get back in there before Dean gets himself iced along with you. Freya left, and Dean turned to Morris, looking resigned. I really did mean to stay with Arcadia. I really did love it here. Morris sighed. Six months... You understand that's a token offer. Six months, six years. Doubt we'll survive that long. Some do. Doesn't matter. I'm a doctor. I can't see patients anymore. I got one recourse left. Gotta go back to the city. Six months, maybe I can come back. But for now, it's my only chance. For me, too. I know that if I go back, it'll be pretty much confirming everything Banner thinks about me already, but... I'll die out here. If I don't have a home with Arcadia, I don't have a prayer without the city. Morris came over and gave her a hug almost automatically, slipping the radio back to her. Six months, maybe we can try again. I mean, if you wanted to come back out past the red line, we could go together. Probably wouldn't get back to the live we had six weeks ago, but maybe we could... And then she was kissing him passionately, almost without thinking about it. She pulled back to look at him again, heartfelt. I'm going back to the city with you, she declared simply. Pretty soon the house will be mine again, free and clear. We'll both be in the city. I can't afford much, but... Oh, thank God, he blurted and returned the kiss swiftly. This can work out. This can actually work out. Dana laughed despite herself, pleased with the strength of his reaction, and nearly climbed inside him she was holding onto him so tightly. Dean was noticeably quiet on the drive back towards Xanadu. He looked quietly furious about the whole thing. Freya was taking the whole thing with an unnatural, placid calm. Marco was stone-faced. Dana started with Marco sitting in the workshop section. Even, the, even with the rig moving, there were a few things they could work on. Marco let her be his hands one last time. It'll be amazing work once it's finished. You say so. You hate me, then? No. But you really should have destroyed the radio the second you left town. Maybe. But if I had, it would have been harder to go back. Maybe impossible. Marco growled under his breath. So? Dana shrugged. You still think of the Freehold as a home, right? Your mom and baby brother will see you again one day? The city isn't much, but it's been my home for a long time. 
Longer than you've been alive. Marco was unconvinced. My brother's big project is all about showing the city what I've seen and learned from people like you. And I have no doubt he'll succeed one way or another. This time next month, people will be asking questions about what's really out here. And when they do, I'll be there to tell them all about the brilliant, creative, wonderful kids like you. Yeah? Yeah. Dana saw him relax a bit and smiled. One down. The charging station was where their paths would diverge. The Arcadians would head for the rendezvous at Xanadu, while Morris and Dana would turn toward the city. Morris gave them privacy as he charged the bike, and Dana finally got a chance to talk to Freya as they hooked up their own charging cables. My email is full of messages. Apparently someone told the Valley about my change in status. Freya winced. How are they taking it? I sent them an answer explaining everything. It's hard to say what they really think, given the drone patrols have only just let them out. They've been under siege for weeks. They're looking for someone to blame, too. I don't know if they believe my side of the story, but I hope they do. I only knew them a short while, but those people, they were my friends. At least, I hope they were. Freya snorted. Indeed, I was just starting to like you myself. Just starting, Dana smirked. Freya almost smiled back, right at the edge. Another week or two and we would have been friends. Freya blinked quickly, fighting something back. It's a terrible thing to say goodbye to friends, isn't it? Especially when you're not sure you'll see them again. Dana found herself blinking fast, too, keeping tears back. A very terrible thing. So it's good we never made it that far. She wiped her eyes quickly. Where do you go after Xanadu? Freya hesitated. I, I'm not at liberty to discuss that with you. Dana felt it like a shot to the heart, much harder than she thought she would. Right. Of course not. Doesn't matter anyways, given that I'll be elsewhere. Freya looked sick and grasped her hand tightly. I know you plan to go home. Stay strong back there, she said in Dana's ear. I'll keep working on Banner and my father whenever I see him. Maybe if the repository project gets a do-over and works out somehow. I know. We'll find a way. Dean won't see it that way, of course. Sure enough, the second they got privacy, Dean erupted. Why are you going along with this? Dean, this is how it has to be for a while. Besides, the charge is half right. I had the radio. I fight it. I don't have that much of a defense. She gestured back at the rig. You and Freya vouched for me. What happens to you if I fight this and lose? Dean had no answer for that. Why didn't you tell me? I know, you know I don't believe Morris, right? I do. The radio was hidden. I didn't even have access to it half the time. You remember the city. What do you think would have happened if I went back without it? What would have happened if someone found it in my rig when you were at the valley? I know. No excuses. For the first month, I wanted to go home. For the first two months, I felt like I had to go home, even if I liked it here. For six months after that, she felt a lump in her throat. I was scared that if I went back to the city, I'd have to empty myself, if that makes sense. Had to make myself stop thinking about how fresh-grown food tastes, or how leaves crunch under your feet when they fall. I'd have to make myself content without color and flavor and music. Dean looked so sorry for her. But maybe there's a way to be happy and be in the city at the same time. If only because I'll have someone to talk to about it, someone that matters, someone like me. Dean took that in. Well, I guess I should give Morris my thanks, he said finally before turning serious. If you decide to take this on and fight for your place out here, I'll be with you to the end. And I know a few places that could really use the help and don't care if you're iced or not. It's not much compared to what you had this year, but it's probably a safer place to wait out your sentence. You can keep studying, learn a little more about Dean... This is the way it's gotta be. I hid things from you for a year. The least I can do is not get you in worse trouble now. She gave him a sideways look. Besides, six months from now I might need you to take me in again. Dean bit his lip. 
then maybe we should air out some things now. I know you never quite forgave me for leaving the city. I didn't before, but I have now. I had no idea what you were looking for out here, but now I know exactly, and you made the right call, if for no other reason than Freya. Thank you for that. Dean hugged her. Dana pulled back and licked her lips. Listen, about the repository? She pulled her device and tapped quickly at it. If you can still get it launched one day, I've just sent you, well, my contribution. It's a bit of my journal, edited for public consumption. Uh, mostly, it's a letter. What I found out while I was out here, and what people in the city should know when they start looking through the information you're sending them. Direct from the horse's mouth, huh? Dean teased, and she swatted at him. Still, if her brother was being mean to her again, it meant their own relationship was getting back to normal. He sobered. Y you know, I can't let you take that device with you. It's got Wheeler access. Dana gave it back to him without a word. I've still got your city device. Dean glanced over his shoulder. I I'll keep mine, too. We should be in range if you want to call. And what? Say what exactly? Officially, you can't speak to me for six months. In fact, keeping that thing is the worst move you can make after the whole flap with the radio. Keeping my old device let me talk to you for years. You never would have left the shelters without that. Banner can say what he wants about security. Only way the statics change is if we help them. It's what, Arca it's what Arcadia was born to do. It's what 451's for. I'm not ignoring my family. Love you, Dean. She hugged him tightly. Love you, too. At least my brother believes me. <sighs> Dana changed back into her city grays and traded the outfit for a, pre for a fresh power cell. Freya had gone over the map with, a f with her a few times until she knew the way back to town. The air was frosty enough that Freya gave Dana a mask to protect her lungs. Marco's eyes were red as he provided her some provisions for the trip. She gave him a kiss on both cheeks, though he wiped at them furiously. Six months, she promised Dean. I'll get in touch after that. You'll last a week before you're begging to come back, even with the exile, Dean said with that knowing smirk back on his face. We'll keep a light on for you, champ. Dana went to the motorcycle where Morris was waiting. He gave her a helmet, and she put her arms around his waist. The rest of her family went aboard the rig and started moving slowly toward Xanadu. Dana, Dana was proud of herself. She kept from crying until she was well away from them. It was the middle of cold season, and the storms had died down enough to make travel seem safe. Dana had marked the location of shelters where they could wait out the weather and sleep while the bike were charged. Morris drove them toward the city. By chance, she recognized the area. Turn here, she called to him. After Miller's was hit, we came here, Morris breathed, looking out over the rows of lavender plants. Our first date, I guess. Dean told me that lavender plants were perennial. Dana said. Figured the plants had died with the extreme winter, but they'll bloom again in greater numbers. The solar panels had protected some from the frost, and the few flowers were the same dusky purple she remembered. Despite herself, Dana started to set the broken shades back upright, making sure the condensers were still working. Morris smiled softly and helped. This field was my first experience with planting, she admitted to him or for that matter, with doing anything myself. They were the first pretty, sweet-smelling, all-natural flowers I had ever seen in my life. This was the start of it, where I began to change, she thought. Dana and Morris spent some time in the beautiful oasis of color and life among the dust. They'd have to travel by night for a while, but it was worth it. It was likely the last bit of color she'd see for a while. They resumed their ride, Dana taking the driver's seat this time. It was probably the last chance she'd ever have to drive a motorcycle. There were no official roads that led to the city. Officially, there was nowhere to go. 
but Dana spent a lot of her Arcadian life on the move and had learned how to spot the pathways in the dust. There was one obvious route, and she followed it until Morris noticed just how close they were getting. We just passed the red line. We've got to decide exactly when we want to arrive there. If we arrive during the day, we'll get noticed, but if we arrive at night, you'll have to wait for morning before... There was a sudden glint of sunlight in front of her bike, and she slammed on the brakes. It was too late. The tripwire, snapping in front of her, caught the bike by the handlebars and stopped it with a jerk, tangled like a fish in a, in a net. The bike wasn't heavy enough to break her free, and there was a horrible wrenching as she and Morris were thrown head over feet. Dazed, stunned by the sudden attack, Dana tried to get oriented, more confused by the sudden change than scared. What happened? Then the pain hit her, and Dana was paralyzed by it. She felt hands on her, on her suddenly, and she yelped, suddenly understanding that she'd been ambushed. The bag went over her head before she could fight back. Dana had been in the dark for what felt like hours. When the bag came off her head, Dana blinked, trying to focus her eyes. Two figures had zip-tied her hands behind her back and shackled her, and shackled her to a bench. She felt more metal behind her, more metal under her feet. The Fringer Man, she thought in sudden panic. This is the same sort of cage that the Veretti's, Veretti twins had Suresh in when they beat him to death. Her vision was starting to sharpen, just as the two figures that had hauled her in walked out. She saw bright sunlight outside, and then the door slammed shut, sealing her in. Who do you think they are? More, Dana asked Morris. Doesn't seem like Fringers. Van's a regular prison truck, but it's not... She, squint, she squinted at the floor. It's tilted. They found it and stripped the containment unit out for their own use. Who does that? Morris let out a breath. Iced. <clears throat> Iced. Bottom feeders. He strained against his bonds. Told you that I had learned about Arcadia who through my patients who were planning to go feral. Something I didn't know till I got out here myself, that most of the people leaving the city don't get further than a day out. I was told the same thing, but I thought it was thirst that got to them. They run into things they're not ready for and don't survive. There are some who would take advantage of that. Iced out would want new supplies. There are those who flood the city didn't go far enough but won't go home. Uh, rumors about cannibals out past the red line. Where do you think that came from? Dana felt this cold spike of fear. We're right at the red line now, aren't we? The cell opened again and two men came in. They weren't in Fringier uniform. Both of them were wearing protective wraps and masks, the way Freya had been when she first met Dana at the windbreaks. All she could see of them were their haircuts. One had a short mohawk, and the other had bright red hair. Well, well, Red Hair said, and his voice was scrawled digitally by the mask. Usually we catch their people, we'd catch people on the way out of the city. You are the first ones we nabbed going in. You must come from money. Either that or the city's your best bet, Mohawk added, getting way too close to Dana for her to feel safe. Got something waiting for you? Something expensive? Red hair waved him down, and Dana got the sense he was in charge. Fringers pay handsomely for information about life outside the red line. You've clearly gone a long way further than us, and we'd prefer to have that reward money ourselves. He said, silkily, pulling Dana's chin around to make her look at him. Right now, it's worth your life. We don't know anything. You with the Veretti twins? They both laughed. You should be so lucky. Morris was so cool and calm that it actually made Dana's heart race. Guys, you really don't want to be here. In fact, you want to get as far away from me as you can get. Their cloaked captors were unmoved. Where's New Eden? The lead demanded again. Dana froze. How does he know about that? Guys, listen to me. I'm a doctor. This is me trying to save your life. I'm a drifter out past the red line, but at this moment, we're inside the red line. It means the city can find us, and I'm for money. Family's got a lot of it. All the money in the world won't keep you from dehydrating. All we have to do is leave you here for a while and let the sun interrogate you for us. And there was a beeping noise coming from Morris's shoe. Red hair and Mohawk looked at each other in concern. Well, now you're too late. 
There was a sudden whine from outside, like a turbine engine. It lasted long, just long enough for them all to notice it. Before any of them could mention it, two huge metal hooks punctured the cage walls, one on either side of the room. There was half a second of metallic groaning, and the top half of the cell tore away, ripped up into the sky, revealing a fringer aircraft hovering overhead like a great bird of prey. Dana barely had time to let out a shout of shock before a team of fringers dropped on zip lines. Dana felt her hands go free and someone ar someone's arms go around her. She was instantly airborne. The whole rescue had happened so quickly she barely understood what was happening until they were on the aircraft itself. Dana was shaking from the feelings pouring through her. The, ideas of fringers re the idea of Fringers rescuing her was as alien as anything she'd experienced in the last year. Morris was there, hugging her tightly, giving her a soft, gentle explanation. They're elite. It's part of the package for Gold Sector residents. Anywhere in the city limits, I can call for rescue. Tracker's subcutaneous. It can't be stolen. Finally came back into range when I reached the red line. Father probably had him watching for me since I left home. First time they've been able to locate me in two years. Dana was still reeling when the elites took over. They checked her for injuries, took her vitals, searched her for concealed weapons. Dana's eyes locked on the viewport. They were already back over the city, far beyond the windbreaks. Drop her off here. Sir, we're taking you to be secure. There's a hundred places you can land between here and there, and you'll use one. Safer with you than anywhere. Morris barked over them. Dana heard the ring of authority. He'd been used to having lawmen obey him. Ten minutes back within the red line, and he was already giving orders. You're certainly back in the city's reach now. Morris gave Dana a tight hug. I gotta deal with this. There will be a report. I'll keep your name out of it if I can. My father will want to know where I've been for the last two years. Dana thought of the radio, still in her duffel. I've gotta see what's left of my life, too. She glanced at the guards and impulsively planted a kiss on the corner of his mouth. Call me when you can talk. I will. Dana restored the cursed Fringer radio and turned it in, and turned it in at the first law she came to. The kid behind the desk scanned in the serial number on the radio and his eyes bugged out when he saw who had requisitioned it and when. Dana made no reaction to the way his eyes flicked to her. He's wondering who I am and why Crawley was issuing me gear over a year ago. He must assume I'm some kind of secret agent for Crawley. Well, he's not the only one. She knew it couldn't last. Crawley had checked the radio out and given it to her, which meant he'd know it had been returned. She could probably expect to see him by the time she reached her house. The Fringers were grim reapers to her again. But she made it home and there was nobody there. No fringers, no guards, not even a call on her device. Keeping the radio was the smart move, she reassured herself. If I tried to come home without it, I'd be starting with a criminal charge. If you'd destroyed this radio six months ago, you'd be on your way back to the valley now. A traitor's voice counted in her head, but she shook that off. The last walk back to the house felt like the end of the journey. The concrete under her feet felt unearthly. She'd gotten used to grass or dirt. Even mud, concrete, concrete was uniform. The ground was always the same under her shoes. Her city device chimed when Morris sent her a message. There is so much red tape in coming back, I'm thinking of hanging myself with it. The response was perfect in setting Dana's mind at ease. Call me when you can, I've probably got some re-entry problems of my own to deal with. The house seemed smaller than she remembered. It was actually roomier than the rig, but the view was closed in tightly. Buildings on every side. She couldn't see the horizon or the sky. She shook off the feeling. She had been thrown all out of sorts when she first joined Dean and Freya, unsettled by the open wilderness. She'd feel more at home here in time. The idea made her sad for a moment. She'd get used to being back in the greys, back in the crowds, back in the factory. The place was still lived in. Which was the point, of course. Micah had taken over expenses when she left. Dana knocked on the door. There was the sound of footsteps, and the door opened as far as the chain would allow. Micah peered out, and she let out a bark of relief. Dana! The door slammed shut, the chain slid, and Micah threw the door open again. 
Dana hugged her tightly, then pulled back in shock. She'd spent months in the company of people who could conjure food from dust, even from misty air. Seeing her old friend rail, thin eyes huge in her drawn face, Micah looked back at her with the same disbelief. Dana had eaten real food while she was gone. She'd been working with projects. She'd filled out and even had some muscle on her frame. God, who'd you eat out there? Micah croaked the sight of her. Dana almost laughed and pushed her way into the house. The shelter didn't really pay much attention to the identification for its work parties. The information was meant to be available, but the shelters were the one place the fringers didn't bother with. There was more profit in the work parties. Shelters worked on volume more than qualifications. None of them would have noticed she was gone. She had lost her job, of course, but that wasn't a surprise. Dana had no real love for her time there. Ration-level jobs were not hard to come by. She could have gone to the shelter and waited for a work party to be formed, but with her debts cleared and Micah's rent paid through the month, she had time to find something better. Technically, the house would remain in Micah's fake name for a while yet. It had almost caused an argument, wondering if Dana was legally obligated to return to the shelter for another few weeks. The first time she put her ration card down at the diner, she almost called her brother for rescue. The protein packs were just as she remembered them. Stomach cramps came back instantly, and there were urchins sniffing around outside, hoping to get some scrapings off the wrappers. This was your whole life before, she reminded herself again and again. You lived your whole life and never tra tasted a strawberry or an apple. You never smelled lavender. You'd never pet a cat. Nothing different about any of this, except for you. Except she didn't like to dwell on that. Micah was full of questions, and Dana had answered all of them. News of what life beyond the red line was really like had taken Micah completely by surprise. Arrested for pigment infractions, they'll be sentenced in the morning. Seems strange arresting people for trying to mix paints. Paints aren't illegal. Stealing them is. They were making their own. You're saying creativity should be illegal? If these people were so were any good as so-called artists, then they'd have patrons. The creative output of all human civilization is available for enjoyment through entirely legal means. What if you can't afford it? It gives you the right to make your own. How's that fair to all the people who can afford such things? If people can make paints without paying, why are we tolerating this kind of selfish? Uh, selfishness. Dana turned the talk show off sickly. Why do you have to be good enough to have a patron if you enjoy making a picture? The screen switched itself on again so she hadn't paid the fees to keep it off. She'd waited another two days. Still no summons from Crawley. He's been... He's just been elected to high office. Maybe he doesn't care anymore, she reasoned with herself. Didn't even call him once the entire time I was out there. Maybe he's forgotten about me. On day three, she was making breakfast. Synth eggs were always more rubbery pucks than anything resembling food. Dana's mother had taught her how to boil them for hours to make them taste pretty close to how the more expensive synth tasted. Nothing like real food, but better than what she'd get by following directions on the packet. Her device chimed, and she felt her hair straighten out in all directions from the sudden spike in panic. Fear, she thought to herself. You were scared all the time back before. You weren't, and you weren't scared when you lived in the valley. She looked hard at the device. She didn't recognize the contact information, so she, ran, so she answered it. Hello? Is it everything you remembered? If not, you could always come and spend some time with me up here in Gold Sector. They got greenery and real food. Yes, please. Dinner tonight? I'll come pick you up. Dana looked around. You live in Gold Sector. I don't want you seeing where I live. I'd need a shower just walking down my street. Yeah, because we've really been putting on airs for the last year. Fine. I'll send a car for you. I'll be ready. I missed you. They made their goodbyes, and Dana saw Micah in the doorway with her jaw hanging open. You're going up to Gold Sector? She nearly screeched. What the hell happened to you out there? A lot of things, Dana admitted, feeling oddly serene in the face of Micah's panicky, panicky uncertainty. She's me. This was me a year ago. Listen, Micah, I need your help with something. Do you know where I can get a decent outfit to wear? Something more appropriate for a hot date? 
The town car that pulled up was an autonomous car, which meant it was worth more than Dana and Micah together could make in a decade. It was like something from a fairy tale. She felt the eyes of everyone in the street glued to the car. They passed the station, and she saw the hundreds of people lined up to cram their way into the monorail. She'd been like them once, craning her neck for a glimpse of the living things at the top of the gold sector towers. Everything I ever dreamed of, she thought to herself, but shook off the unsettling irony. She was about to go have dinner with Morris in a ritzy gold sector tower. It's going to be a good night. As the wounded and refugees from the launch filtered into Xanadu, Banner was giving orders crisply, making it an order that all wheelers and freeholders within a hundred clicks of the city are to have files for defenses. Defensive weapons are better than nothing. Those spike drones covered our escape once already. I want everyone equipped and trained to use them. Yes, sir. Wicker nodded on his screen. Yana, Yana has already contacted, contacted me twice, asking what else Xanadu needs. We've got sufficient medical care and food supply for them, but most of them are stranded until we can get more rigs built. We might be limited to printing motorcycles for now. want as many people as, as far as possible from the city before dawn. We're still sorting out the disruption after Miller's scrapyards hit. Some people are still at freeholds when they should have moved on to projects. A third of our wheelers are moving half the speed and range with extra cargo to make up the numbers. I know. Can't be helped, though. Can't send our people anywhere without somewhere for them to go. Banner nodded, yawning. Have the, have the Valas deploy their heavy cargo drones to land. Make things tight for them, but we need the carrying capacity on land more than they need it in the ocean. Oh, on that note, you got a call from the Valdez about an hour ago. They finally worked through their backlog of cargo drones, checked the tissue samples you sent from the Veretti twins. Delay meant they had to run the samples through some pretty careful tests because of the decomposition, but they say the cause of death was asphyxiation. Banner blinked, shifting topics. Ah, small compartment, but I wouldn't think the dust had build up fast enough for... No, no, chemical asphyxiation. They were gassed with something. Banner's eyes bulged. Where's Dean Harper right now? The dress was a size too small. On Micah, living on protein paste, it fit fine. On Dana's new frame, it was almost indecently tight. Even so, she expected Morris would like the way it looked on her. She was right. His jaw dropped when he saw her. He was wearing a tux of his own. It was the first time she'd seen him in a suit. For that matter, it was the first time she'd seen him without road dust and a day's stubble. He looked like he'd stepped out of a movie. And Dana felt her heartbeat tick up. She'd had meals with him, curled up in a sleeping bag against the cold, even assisted with surgery, but she'd never been to a restaurant with him. She hadn't even noticed, but another difference between the city and Arcadia were the communal meals. There was no such thing as a waiter among the wheelers, but here in the restaurant there were a dozen of them. One for the food, one for the wine, one for the dirty dishes as they finished each course. Moroccan-style salmon with natural brown greens. The waiter said politely as he placed her main course down before her and then the other plate in front of Morris. Both portions were tiny. Kobe beef and matsutake mushroom sauce. If he noticed Dana didn't belong, he didn't let it show. Enjoy your meal. She could tell Morris was making an effort to impress her, but it must have shown on her face. Well, this isn't working, is it? Restaurant was a mistake. It's a wonderful gesture, Doc, but this is the closest thing to a great dress I have, and I had to barter for it, and the waiters are still better dressed than me. The restaurant isn't the problem. I am. I wanted... I don't know, but I know you liked it more out there. Grew up with this sort of thing, and if money can help with anything, it's impressing a beautiful girl with exclusive clubs, fancy restaurants, that type of thing. Only reason any any guy wants to be rich, I'm sure. She drawled, but inwardly she was pleased. Oh, he called me beautiful. I'm acting like a teenager. Well, Morris said. Well, Morris said decisively. Way well, yeah, I figure it. We got two options. One, I can I can try bribing everyone in here to change into grays. He smiled a bit as she laughed. Or two, we could get dinner to go. Where do you have in mind? Morris seemed to think for a moment, but Dana could tell it was long planned. How about the dome? 
You ever seen a real tree up close? He still doesn't know about the forest outside the valleys. Dana was awed at the thought. She'd experienced a real forest outdoors with animals living in it, and Morris was trying to impress her with a garden. The waiter chose that moment to bring over the wine bottle, showing Morris the label. Morris quickly informed the waiter they'd be getting their meal to go, and the waiter immediately acquiesced, taking the bottle back into the kitchen, unopened. Dana smirked at the, smirked at the awkward way Morris tried to reach after him for a moment to summon the wine back. Probably fake anyway. It was a vineyard. It was a vineyard anymore. Oh, I'm sure it's real. That's why it's expensive. Like I said, I'm trying to impress you. It's working, but this tower is designed for rich people, which means there has to be somewhere convenient we can get more drinks. She took a deliberate pause. Like your place? His eyes went dark. Yeah, that works. Morris's apartment in the tower was still twice the size of her home. It was tastefully appointed with a few art books, or artworks and a shelf of real books, all things Dana would never be able to afford. Morris went into the kitchenette to get some coffee brewing, and she hung her wrap with his coats, one casual, one dressy, and one in Arcadian colors. It was her, it was her first time in, her, in his apartment, and she was glad she hadn't let him see her own place. The room was so perfectly clean. Nothing old, nothing faded, no cracks in the paint. The, no cracks in the paint. The mantelpiece had photographs and expensive frames, but it was clear there was one missing. You hid the picture of your other girlfriend? She guessed around, she guessed aloud. Huh. How about some music? I can afford the royalty fees if you, fees if you want something local. How about Topian Trio? Dana called back, only half-joking. Sort of our song by now, right? Morris laughed. Only recording I've got is my other jacket. Dana smiled a bit at her shared secret life with him and went to the coat rack, collecting the long coat he wore out past the red line. The recorder was easy to find, and she set it to play the improv tune she'd first heard with him when they were in the, sonar, in the solar shelter. As the music started to play, Dana glanced back at the kitchen to see if he was watching and pulled the coat a little closer, inhaling the faint traces of red dust, real spices, and just a trace of his unique smell. She breathed it deep and felt herself relax. Yes, this would be enough for her. Everything, work, everything was going to work out fine. When she hung the coat back up, Dana noticed a slender chip sticking out of the pocket. She looked closer, absently, then paused. It was identical to the data card that Banner had after the Maker's Meat attack. The bait for a spy, the card that would send a virus into any Fringer device it was plugged into, or any other Fringer device network to it. Morris was one of Banner's other subject, other suspects? He said his Trojan virus didn't work. Nobody tried to use them. Then it was something else. Then there was some... Uh, then there was something else, something she was missing, that had hit her. Banner told the Arcadian leadership about his failed spy hunt and how nobody took the bait. He didn't tell everyone else. Morris didn't know it was a trap. Dana stared at the data card, feeling her brain explode. She was having a revelation and could barely see past it, but she couldn't figure out what it meant. Morris, she heard a voice say, it just occurred to me. You knew where the salt mine was. You'd been to see Suresh before? Several times. Aside from being his doctor, I was making sure his stock was being used to preserve food correctly. Why? Well, it just occurred to me that if you came back here, your patients would need a new doctor. You ever been to Valdez Station? They've got doctors there. The old oil rig they took over? Morris was surprised by the question. No, I never visited it. The ocean and I aren't destined to be friends. He waved a hand back and forth. I mean, nobody wants a doctor who can't stop puking his guts out from seasickness, especially since they got their own medical staff. Dana relaxed. Of course, nothing to worry about. Closest I ever got was a supply boat, Dana Morris said on his way to the kitchen. Dana felt her heart stop and then speed up dramatically. Be right back, she called through to him, trying madly to sound casual. I forgot. I needed a re I needed to return a call to my accountant. It takes some work to get your life back. 
Okay. Coffee will be ready in just a second. Dana closed the balcony door beside her and ran to the edge, trying to get some distance as she pulled out her device and dialed the number her brother gave her. Please, for mercy's sake, have him still be in range. The line rang eight times before he answered. Less than a week. I knew you weren't be able to help yourself. It's Morris! That radio was from Crawley, but the spy was Morris! Her brother didn't answer. The places I went to, the places that made Banner suspect me, Morris was there too, Dana made her case, speaking quickly. The salt mine, the supply boats, the scrapyard. As a doctor, he was mobile and welcome in every hidden enclave of, of everything. Of our people, even. Still nothing from her brother. She looked at the device in her hand and found the screen showed a message. This, de this device has been locked due to security and information encryption. No, Dana whispered, and very slowly turned back toward the apartment. She caught a glimpse of Morris looking sickly at her before half a dozen, half a dozen men in fringer armor bolted out on the balcony, coming at her. Dana didn't even have time to panic before the bag went over her head. I would say that's a fantastic cliffhanger to leave off on. Uh, it's time for intermission. Oh. I am going to get up, stretch, maybe grab a little snack, all that sort of thing. Nope, don't do that. Don't do that. I didn't click that button on purpose. I'm going to be right back. Uh, we're going to listen to more of that... Uh, more of that Poulenc that we were listening to up top. Uh, I'll be back in about 15 minutes. Now's a great time for you to get up, stretch, walk around, do that sort of thing. Um, if you've been sitting with me, if you've been standing, perhaps take a moment to, to sit and rest your legs. Get hydrated, certainly. Uh, water is very important. Take any necessary medications if you have, uh, if you have to take them once a day and you're prone to forgetting. Here's your reminder. Uh, pet your pets, certainly. Uh, and if you do pet your pets, come join my Discord and post pictures of those pets. We'll be back in about 15 minutes. Everyone behave, yeah? Uh, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Paper Cuts. Uh, last we left off, Dana found out, surprise, that uh, her beloved doctor, Morris... Uh, was actually the traitor the whole time. And he, in fact, fessed up. Wildly. Sort of. He sort of fessed up to try and get Dana back into the city. And uh, on the tale, on the tales of that horrific revelation... She tried to inform her brother only to find that her phone had been copyright stricken by the music she was playing from the Wheeler band that she met Morris when it was being played. That's the note we jump back into this tale to uh, wrap it up on. This tale, by the way, if I have not made that clear, is Wheeler's by Matt Stevens. We are reading it by gracious, gracious author permission. Uh, I would heartily suggest either buying the book or uh, getting it from your local library. Unclear if it is available from your local library. I have found it in some library systems and not in others. But what I have found is you can get it through... Um, oh, I don't remember the name of the website now, of course. But uh, the... It's a, uh, essentially, you, it, it's online shopping for your local bookshop. You set which bookshop is your local bookshop and that you want to support. And then you pay a little extra, not a lot of extra. You pay a little extra in buying the book. And then the bookshop that you've set as your local bookshop gets a little bit of money as though they had made the sale. It's kind of a way for them to fill the gap between it and... Uh, the K 
Kindle Empire, as it were. I will, in the Discord, uh, link that site because it's a very easy one. It's a very easy one to use, I've found, and a very handy one to use. Uh, speaking of things that I can link and things that I can talk about, uh, aside from my Discord, we have uh, the little bug above my head, the little logo above my head. That's for a group of reading streamers called the Codex. It's actually my Twitch team, which I think is displayed below the stream. Uh, well, it's definitely displayed below the stream on desktop. Uh, less clear about mobile, but I digress. It's a group of reading streamers. We all uh, kind of run the gamut, whether we stick purely to public domain or are picking up author permission. Uh, we kind of run the gamut on uh, genre. Uh, not all of us are exclusively reading streamers. Uh, like myself, Gariki occasionally dabbles in things outside reading, for example. Uh, I think I've seen Jevons uh, jump in on some things outside reading as well, but I digress. Uh, we're all we're all reading aloud streamers. We're all kind of trying to push Twitch to give us straight up and down a reading aloud category. I would personally love to see the reading aloud category happen. You know, uh, I'm I'm kind of a special exception, as it were, in that I can pick the talk shows uh, category in comparison to everyone else who has to pick a game that isn't really a game called Reading Fun, which there used to be another game called Reading Simulator, but that stopped being sold on Steam, so you can't use that anymore. Um, I digress. Codex, they're, they're great people. They make great stuff. Uh, Gariki actually has been running recently a series on the ins and outs of moderation. Uh, like moderation of live streams which like the bits and pieces i've seen really neat actually i'd suggest it if you're at all interested in you know if you've got a green sword anywhere or you run your own stream i'd suggest it it's it's really interesting he, he goes into like the nuances of why certain things are the way they are why we need to do certain things it's neat uh what else while i'm promoting things i have my own youtube channel uh, it is just about as far behind as the podcast feed is, which, by the way, lest you didn't know, this is also a podcast, this thing we do Friday nights. This is also a podcast where you can listen to it at your own leisure, at your own speed. So if you ever feel like, man, I really wish you'd read faster, go download Paper Cuts in your favorite podcatcher. Give that a shot. I think there's... Um, speed controls in most podcatchers these days um but the youtube channel actually acts as another form of podcast feed essentially just it's all of the stream vods i have some stuff that i've been working on the back burner uh you know a little bit more highly edited content that may eventually come together but until it does there's just vods over there uh i technically have a tiktok I don't like to promote it because I don't like it. I don't like it and I don't like doing it, but it is for some reason required of me in this day and age. I don't even have a, a chat command for it. I should probably write one. I digress. Uh, I do things elsewhere, long story short. Look me up. It's either Glacier Space Nester or Glacier underscore Nester, depending on whether the website allows it. The one exception to that is Tumblr, actually. Uh, despite continuing to randomly set on fire as tumblr is wont to do uh i do actually spend quite a bit of time on tumblr uh it's i've been thinking about posting some of the discord uh some of the previously discord only content uh just to get it out into the world <laughs> a little more um oh speaking of the discord I'm jumping back a few here, but the Discord is not just for you to yell books at me to read. It's also really great if you like pictures of food or pets. I often post uh, pictures of the food that I'm making, uh, you know, usually bread. Uh, the, my Discord in particular actually gets uh, some unique shots that most Discords do not get. Uh, I'll hang out in the Discord while I'm ripping DVDs. I'll hang out in the Discord while I'm editing episodes. 
that kind of stuff. The things you would normally see, like, as a pay what you want on a Patreon, I've been doing in the Discord, just because I feel like, I like, I like you all, I love you all, you're fantastic. I feel like there are not a lot among you who would pay for a Patreon at this point. Which I don't blame you, I wouldn't pay for a Patreon for me, yet. I got, I got other stuff to do. Anyway. Spiel, 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 spiel. I do things. They're fun things. Promise you should look them up. Let's... I've dillied, I've dallied, I've tarried long enough. Let us find out what is going on with Morris here. Is he really the traitor? Did Dana guess correctly? They held her until they could clear a path to move her unobserved. One or two of the people holding her arms were making suggestive remarks. Dana felt their hands going further along her body than they needed to. She suddenly remembered how she was dressed and felt sick. The dress was woefully inappropriate for such a... such a hostile setting. Morris saw her trying to writhe away from their grip and quickly swept his jacket around her shoulders. From the texture, she could, st she could tell it was uh, his Arcadian outfit. She was dragged to the elevator and tanked into a level that smelled of stale coffee and nico vape. The elevator had made no stops on the way. It was likely nobody had seen her being taken away, and nobody would have been able to help her anyway. She could hear Morris there, speaking softly with the Fringers, telling them to be gentle with her. Dana could handle the darkness, she could heal, and she could handle the claustrophobic press of bodies, and she'd been dealing with that for a whole life. What was making her panic was the betrayal. Morris had turned her in. He was the spy. Banner had almost hoped it was the new girl. He'd never have even noticed the doctor, who had full access to everywhere that needed medical care. When had it happened? Had he always been a spy? Had the Fringers recruited him? Was he being coerced against his will in some way? Her brother had taken her to some sensitive areas in the Arcadian world, the sort of places a spy would like to know. Was it all a long con to get those locations? She'd been warned repeatedly to, to not give anything away, and she hadn't. But she didn't know Morris was spying deliberately. Had he been tracking her somehow without her knowledge? The letters concert the love was it all a lie she was dragged to her room and put in a chair and suddenly all was silence dana stayed still for several minutes trying to process enough to think clearly the blindfold was removed it was morris they were alone in a room together it wasn't a cell it was more like an office she was secured to the chair by plastic zip ties there was a window, and Dana craned her neck to see that she was still in the towers of the gold sector. Hang on, there's something off screen that will drive me absolutely batty if I let it continue to happen. Give me just a moment. Oh. <sighs> Sorry, there was something off-screen making a noise, and so I had to adjust it to stop making a noise. It was driving me bonkers. Like, you all probably couldn't hear it because of the way I have things structured around here. But I could hear it, and it was making me nuts. Ooh, actually, uh, this thread reminds me, that's one of the things that comes up on the Discord uh, that hasn't been coming up anywhere else, is... I've been doing a lot of embroidery lately, uh, you know, in the spirit of the book we're reading here. I've been making a lot of visible mends to my clothing, and uh, invisible mends to Raz's clothing, for that matter. I'm just sick of having to buy new stuff <laughs> all the time. I'm just like, I know, I can learn how to fix this, and learn I have. I've been learning some really interesting things about, like, the relationship between needle size and fabric density and like what stitches work best where how i can best apply certain embroidery techniques uh how i should really plan ahead a little farther uh that one's especially relevant if you've been in the discord recently i'm like i'm gonna put this wild goose chase st stitch on over top of these holes only to realize that the wild goose chase stitch is not a detached stitch it is a filling stitch, but it needs to anchor in fabric every time. Frustrating. Anyway. 
I could I could rattle on about embroidery for a while. I've been doing a lot of it lately, after all. Let's resume the book. Where are we? Headquarters. They're based out of the Central Tower. The, the leadership likes to keep them close, and they've got a better access speed here than anywhere else in town. They can run their recon and drone flights from here anywhere, better than anywhere else. Fringer Central. Heart of the Beast, she thought. Why? She heard her voice say, finally. It was the only real question she wanted an answer to. Morris sighed. That picture I took off my mantelpiece wasn't an ex. It was a family photo. Me and my father. He took, a he took his device from his pocket and tapped the screen to show a family photo. Crowley? Crowley is your father. Dana grated out, everything in her brain realigning. All that talk about how he cut you out of the family trust when you wanted to become a doctor, holding your grades to ransom? They're all true stories. I, I never lied to you, Dana. I just omitted a few names. He tried to explain, making promises. After I graduated, I had student debts. Scholarships only go up to the 95% bracket. Father said he'd pay if I got top 90, and I just barely missed. So your father's a callous scumbag. That's not a surprise. I know. Glad Luke would have told him to go walk into a snowstorm, but that won't cover my costs, so I had to... Morris looked ill. I had to pay my own way. The only way I knew I could do that was to unlock my trust funds early, and the only way I could do that, well... You, so you go to your father again, hat in hand, and he gave you a mission. Because if they'll accept anyone out there, it'll be a doctor. Dana nodded, suddenly seeing it. You were out there so much longer for me than me. What were you waiting for? Access. Your brother took you places you never would have seen if you were gone it alone like me. Newcomers rarely get further than the freeholds. Eventually, they needed a doctor in other places. Told my father they used the junkyard, but I also told them they were just using scraps for themselves to make food and water telling him not to bother since it wasn't a threat. But he could make it seem like one, so he hit a bunch of scrappers. Then he demanded a target that actually mattered. For the record, I didn't give him the Valdez. He had other sources like the Veretti twins. I, I told him about the workshops. My father's people said the probing attacks were assembled there, and when I noticed that your brother had an identical package being assembled in the rig, well, I called it in. Dana thought back to when he'd been on the rig. After Suresh was hit, we were making room for salvage and you saw Dean's workshop. That's why the Fringers bothered to send actual people to hit them at the Maker's Meet. You knew Dean was running 451 because he told us. But why me, Morris? What did I do to make you think I'd be okay with this? What happened between us had nothing to do with it. I never would have... You said you left town to clear your debts and then... Dana swiftly understood. Then you saw that radio in my things the night Dean told us about the repository. You thought I was like you, an agent, taking names, tracking locations? That's why I took the blame. I was ready to come back anyhow. I wanted you to come back with me. Morris looked down. You had to leave your house behind for a year. When this was done, I could have offered you penthouse. When this was done? You mean after my brother and everyone he loves is locked up or dead? She set her jaw. You told me that you were out there because you were able to do more doctoring on the fringes than you ever could do in this tower. That the rules were just too set against you here in the city. I know it was a cover story, but it was also the truth. You're a doctor. How can you be in favor of this? It's not such a leap, Morris said with a painful shrug. Doctors have been on battlefields for centuries. It's not a war. On the contrary, young lady. Another voice spoke from behind her. This is a war for the most important prize there is. The future. Dana couldn't turn, but Crawley himself had come into the room. He came over to stand in front of her, superior. His eyes lingered over her outfit in a way that made her skin crawl. I must say, this is disappointing. When we first met, I hoped you'd be an asset. Alas, you went the other way. 
your actions were sufficient to make you an actual annoyance. I'm told you were instrumental in thwarting our operation at the Maker's Meet. He shook his head. It's unfortunate you succeeded. It was really my last chance to take prisoners. Dana was about to argue that point when she realized what it meant. N no more prisoners. The escape at the last gathering forced my hand. It was the first application of military force authorized under my administration, and word is already getting out. I need a clear win. Sending troops twice would be messy and expensive, even though the, we've thwarted their concentrated attack on the city. They were sending a library over the walls, and there's nothing to stop them from simply trying again. The Wheeler Network's the key to their ability to threaten our city and its population. Oh, we can't let them do as they please, given what's at stake. Are there cameras on somewhere? There's never been a plan for them to attack the city. You should know this, given that you... Oh, wait, no, that's Dana. There's never been a plan for them to attack the city. You should know this, given your son knew it too. He knows all about the launch you blew up. My son has made a final report. I'm satisfied that this is the best solution to an imper imperfect problem, Crawley declared with finality. I'm told that the Arcadian network is almost all made of civilian families. I'm told the Wheelers are the backbone of their infrastructure and organization since they're so carefully decentralized. Is he wrong? No, Dana admitted to herself, but she didn't say it out loud. I told you when we met. Their lives are not a problem for us. Their infrastructure is what we wanted. The Wheelers are a very small percentage of their people, but with them gone, the rest won't be an issue. Not for long. Dana tried to unpack that. The Wheelers are Arcadia's trade routes, their assembly line, their delivery service, their... It hit her suddenly. Xanadu. After the last attack, they're gathering at Xanadu to make repairs. Morris knew that. He heard Banner set the rendezvous. Oh, Morris gave us that location months ago. He couldn't make a strike. The heat wave was keeping him there with you. By the time he could leave, all the wheelers had taken off. We've, wa we've waited this long for them to gather again in numbers. And you got your chance by hitting the meat. We saved the people, but lost the rigs, so when they gather to rebuild... I can't discuss operations with the enemy. Let's talk about you. We've got enough on you to have you shot, you know. But my son, he was quite insistent you'd see things our way, giving your reasons for turning to them, for joining them in the first place. Crawley turned to go. Even so, we'll need to keep you in custody for another hour or two. After that, it won't matter. They've already gathered in one place. The attack's happening right now, Dana thought in horror. Why do you hate them so much? For the last year living with them, I've never seen them threaten anything but our garbage. Why do you hate them? The old man regarded her for a moment, trapped between his desire to leave her uninformed and his inherent nature to lecture and grandstand. The system works because everything is in balance. The system works because the support mechanism involves everything. The utilities provide and the public supports. Same with food, water, housing, security, medicine. The whole world is a support mechanism for everything else, and they just don't accept that. Food doesn't work. People are starving. Water and housing don't work. People are living off dewdrops, sleeping in the gutter. Hell, even your security can only patrol as far as... Dana broke off. She suddenly got it. That's it, isn't it? You don't dare let people figure out there's a way to live completely independent of civilization because the way things are isn't working. And when people figure out they don't need the city at all, it's over for you. You can live away from civilization, Crawley said as though speaking holy writ. Out past the red line, there are nothing but criminals and cannibals. That's not true. I've been there for a year. So is your son. Yes, I have my son's report right here. Crawley tapped at his own device. He reports so many infringements that even if we bothered to arrest them all, they'd never be let out again. And his final report is the Wheelers. And that they are the only reason Arcadia works as a whole. Crawley looked hard at her. I was told you weren't part of that world. Or at least that you didn't want to be. You went off-grid one year ago. After repeatedly telling the people who kn knew you best, you'd be back as soon as you cleared some utility debts by time sharing out your house. And then you cleared those debts and you came back to civilization. Just like you said you would. 
They were never more than a mobile home to shelter for you anyway. Dana, Dana nearly swallowed her tongue. She had thought the same. She had thought the same thing at first. Call off the strike. There are people too. I've seen it. People leave the city every day, just like I did. These, those are our people. They're just living somewhere else. That's why I have to do this. The people who are leaving, they don't know what's out there. I had someone waiting to meet me, but most of the people who leave, they never know what they're going to find. They're they're going anyway. Ask your son. He's the one who told me so. Blowing up the wheelers won't stop the exodus. This won't change anything. It'll change things a great deal for the people like us, Morris said quietly, and his father gave him a sharp look. Dana stared at Morris, then at his father, then back to Morris, trying to unpack that. Like us, what does that... And then it hit her. You're not afraid of people leaving. You're afraid of what happens if they come back. Arcadia is the exact opposite of our entire way of life. We've never had an accurate census of them, but our intel... He gestured at Morris, making it clear what that meant suggests that your, their numbers are growing to an unprecedented level, enough that they may, in fact, outnumber us, and they don't follow any of our laws or respect any of our ways. You're my proof. When you came back, were you so willing to go back right to the way things were? Dana had no answer. He was right. There was silence as Dana realigned her understanding of the situation. You're afraid, she said in disbelief. You're afraid of what happens to the way things are when people find out there's literally any other way to live. It's not practical at all, is it? She said, as though finally understanding everything. All this time, I was trying to figure out the reason I've been defending the city, defending you. No matter how cold and calculating the fringers were, I always believed they were practical. So surely there had to be a reason why you opposed their ways so much, and now I find out it's just spite. You can't make a profit on self-sufficient people, and you want to punish them for being able to live without paying for you, paying you for the privilege. Spite isn't a motive, it's a flaw, Crawley said with certainty. We're trying to protect our way of life. Life has changed, the world has changed, Dana insisted, barely keeping up with her thoughts. And the only way to keep it the way you like it, with yourself in charge of everyone, is if you stop the change from happening. You're the proof, Dana. How many times did your brother or banner or someone treat you like your mad just for talking like a city resident? Except you've already lost that fight. You sent hundreds of troops to make a strike on the Maker's Mead. All those people were your troops. They'll remember that there were no guns, no bombs. The only people who have seen your kind can be trusted, Crawley said flatly. Well, except for you. Crawley turned to his son. You're sure about this? She'll understand in time. She's loyal to her brother, is all. Hmm. I leave it with you then, son. There are children there. Dana tried to stop him, desperately. I've been there. Morris has been there. There are children in Xanadu. Crawley was unmovable. If those people cared about their kids, they'd bring them to civilization instead of leaving them to the ferals out beyond the red line. You don't believe that any more than I do. Perhaps. But on the off chance anyone notices, and on the slimmer chance anyone cares, and the even slimmer chance that anyone asks, on the infinitesimal chance anyone's listening when the question's spoken aloud, well, my answer will satisfy them, Crawley said simply. Nobody cares about what's beyond the red line, Miss Harper. Like the whole climate change hoax a hundred years ago, if anyone believed it was really happening, something would have been done. Crawley left the room, taking his guards with him. She heard the door lock automatically behind him. Once they were alone, Morris freed her hands. Dana immediately slapped him, and he didn't try to stop her. I had to. How could you turn on them like that? Freya, Marco, Marco, Banner, Rona, you delivered her baby! You patched up their injuries! These people are our friends! Dana, I, I didn't betray them, not exactly what... What's going on is bigger than... No, you can lie to yourself that way if you want, but not to me. This is only a war because your father wants to play it that way. You say it was never meant to be like this. What was it meant to be like? Morris didn't meet her gaze. 
it was meant to just be the resources, just finding out what they were taking from the city and how to stop them. Problem being, they're taking almost nothing. The only thing they get from the city is people. You don't think your father would hit that particular resource? In fact, Banner complained to me once about the black market sales. The city gets more from Arcadia than the other way around. She trailed off. Dana felt the thunderbolt as inspiration hit her, and she fought to keep her expression even. Dana still had Morris's jacket around her shoulders. She pulled the data card out of his jacket pocket. You found out about this from Suresh, she said. You were one of his secret customers. Langford's malady caused by improperly preserved food. Bought extra salt rations for preservation. He told me what it was, but then he was hit and gave it to you. Took me weeks to find another one. Why didn't you give it to your father? Morris took a deep breath. For you. For, for me? That's a valuable piece of intelligence. Held up my end of the deal with my father. I got my trust funds. To save you, well, I needed something equal value. Let things cool down for a day. You can tell my father you've changed your mind. He'll believe you. It's what he'd do. Information on that card could save you. You have no idea. She squeezed the precious chip in her hand, holding it close. Tell your father I want to make a deal right now. What kind of deal? You haven't exactly got a lot to offer. I have enough to buy my brother's life. Him and Freya. Morris had taken her a few rooms deeper into Fringer Central. This room was the control center for all the drone fleets. Every inch of the room was full of displays, both on screens and hollow. Most of them were regular images of traffic drones, security patrols, making their way street by street over the city. But on the central display, visible to dozens of pilots and to Crawley, holding court in the middle of the room, was a feed showing a high-altitude shot of Xanadu. Morris had left Dana to get his father's attention. So close to the strike, Crawley wasn't about to be seen leaving the command center, so Dana was brought to him after another scan for listening devices and weapons. Even so, she knew she'd never be out allowed to leave now that she'd seen this room. They're only making nice for now. He'll kill me soon, whatever I have to offer. What have you got? If I tell you, then I lose my bargaining power. I want the deal made and agreed to. If I can deliver, so can you. Crawley looked to his son, and Morris nodded. Her brother and his girlfriend, or his wife, hard to tell the difference sometimes among wheelers. They're two people. She glanced at da he glanced at Dana. Uh, Marco? What about him? They haven't sent him home already. I trust him home with his mother and baby brother more than anywhere closer. She sent a harsh glare at Morris. You delivered his baby brother, as I recall. Crawley didn't move except for his eyes, watching the electric stare down between them. He didn't seem bothered that his son was being put down by this woman. If anything, he was amused, maybe a little annoyed, that Morris wasn't firing back. Finally, Morris broke the stalemate and looked to his father. Two wheelers. It's worth it. You know what she has. She told me what she's offering, but I don't know how she plans to deliver on it. This was a lie. Morris had given her the data card, but he'd meant it to save her. Wanting Dana's forgiveness had forced Morris to let her make the deal for her brother instead. He doesn't know it's a Trojan horse. Dana just stared them down. Wait. Wait. All right, if you've got something worth it, I can agree to your terms. You can ask Morris. He doesn't like me any more than you do right now, but he knows I keep my bargains. That's how I got this job, you know. You're worried. If you deliver, your brother's family will be spared any legal ramifications, Crawley agreed formally, including death, Dana warned him. She wasn't kidding. Obviously. Would you like me to sign it in blood, or is it enough that Morris and a room full of officers have borne witness? Dana gave Morris a death glare. For what that's worth. She took a deep breath and said a quick prayer to anyone who might be listening, and opened her fist to reveal the data card. What's that? This? It's a copy of the Wheeler map with the latest security patch. Patch allows for signals to relay between Wheeler comms from Wheelers to Freeholds to Projects. All of it. 
you'll be able to find everything on their map. Crawley stared her down as if dissecting her story with his eyes. She stared right back, terrified. Her cover story may gave her reason to be scared, too, and she hoped that that would be enough to make her performance believable. She had another move to make. Either he bought this, or everyone she loved was dead. What possible reason could I have to trust anything you give me? Crawley pointed out cattily. It's real. I've been trying to get my hands on one for weeks now. Suresh told me about the update. He was one of my informants. He did some black market trade. Figured he'd be an agreeable sort when this went down. Twins got to him first, so I had to remove him. Morris looked quietly nauseous about it. If you told me they were working for you, they'd be alive right about now. Unfortunate. You weren't getting information about 451 fast enough. Ironic that their attack on Suresh was what made her brother tell you all about it. Oh, whatever. If the data card's legit. This sort of thing isn't handed out often, well, because of this exact situation happening. Crawley looked to his son, wanting to be convinced. Morris offered what he knew. Digital infrastructure is different for wheelers. Their networks are no more centralized than the rest of them. Their devices come into range of each other, and databases, security patches, updates on locations, syncs as they meet each other. Wheeler nets viral, or maybe three people who know the whole map. So, a major update needs to be delivered like a vaccine. Well, I suppose if you had any clue what was coming, you'd have done something other than beg. He took the data card and held it out to his fringers. Maclor, put this in your air gap reader. Run a security scan. Theater felt her heart give a thump. She'd never seen this before. The plan turned to ashes instantly. Maclor took the card, but shook his head. No dice. We've never had any luck with Wheeler codes. Tech infrastructure has got nothing in common with anything we use in the city. Then there's no way to interface, Crawley looked at Dana. Not so lucky for your brother. Dana could say nothing. The fear had raised another notch. She hadn't even noticed how she had gotten used to living without an undercurrent of panic. Maclore looked at the data card again. There might be a way. The wheelers have a mesh network. Possible we can make a connection between our system and theirs. How? Oh. The drones. They're coming in. They're homing in on a large collection of Arcadian targets. All reasons we're targeting them is because they're, they will be congregated. With a mesh network, all the wheelers will be syncing up and sharing data. Maybe we can access the whole wheeler network. If this is a security patch, it'd have the latest codes. Using this card, we could interface our drone fleet with their network, actually get access for once. With so many wheelers logging in, we'll notice one more. It'd mean putting off the attack for a few minutes until we can copy all the information, but worth it. You have a go. Maclore took the data card towards the bank of war room computers. Crawley had already dismissed Dana in his mind, heading to the screens overseeing the attack on Xanadu. Morris came closer, dismissing Dana's guard and moving to her protectively. He rested a hand on her shoulder, trying to be nice. He'll be all right. Your brother will be spared, I promise. We'll find a way to save you, too. Dana couldn't help the way her eyes flicked from Crawley to Maclore's hand and then back again. She barely registered Morris. Crawley didn't notice, focused on the screens, but... Morris saw. Dana, look at me. She finally heard him, eyes flicking to his. He read her face instantly. He knows. He's worked it out. He can't know how, but he must figure out it was a trick. Morris's face was hard to read, but she saw him look at the screens. The wheelers were visible on the screens, if not in detail. The thermal scan was enough to make out people clearly, clearly enough to show that some of them were children. She gave him another desperate look. Please. Morris seemed to soften suddenly, but if he was resigned to it or resolute in his decision, he couldn't. she couldn't tell. But he very deliberately looked away from his father, staying with her, until it happened. At Xanadu Station, Dean was having a heated, desperate conference with Banner. The call dropped out after less than ten seconds, and given what she was telling me, I'm not surprised. You weren't meant to be talking to her anyway, but as it happens, I agree. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Then she was telling the truth? Was Morris one of your suspects? Morris saved lives the entire time he was with us. 
where we decided to let him pass the settlement level. But the Veretti twins were killed by chemical asphyxiation. Your report on the night says Morris called for a tank of anesthetic for his treatment of Suresh. If he was left alone for any length of time, then he could have filled their holding cell with gas and left them until... I'm sold. My rig's still charging. How do we... A moment later, Banner heard it too. Drones, sound the alarm. Too late, Dean shouted, pointing upward. Cloaked by darkness, they had been all but visible at uh, they had been all but invisible at high altitude. But as they made their attack run, diving down on them like hawks in a killing uh, diving down on them like hawks in a killing stoop, the drone fleet came alive with a red sensor light on each of them, menacing as each picked their targets. As they got close enough to strike, Banner had a flash of how many there were and how close. Holy. He breathed, feeling the gathered wheelers scattered around him run for cover. He didn't bother. They were too close, too many. There was no running away, no choice to fight or defend. Only a millisecond to realize they were all about to die. Banner bared his teeth in raw frustration, closing his eyes automatically. Going to die now. Thunk. Banner opened his eyes in disbelief. The drone had flown straight into the ground, its ordnance unlaunched. Heavy thumps came from all around as the entire drone fleet just fell out of the sky. A metal rain that could be avoided, though most wheelers who were still out in the open had little chance to run. We had no warning, Dean said, stupefied. I don't understand. What's killing them? What's knocking them down? And Banner started to laugh like the devil himself fingering one of the data cards in his pocket. I can think of one thing. Dana heard a dozen people start shouting from all the terminals as those piloting the drones suddenly lost control. It's shutting down the whole network. Kill the connection. Firewall or system. Too late, Macklore shouted, and in the same instant, the lights went out. That's how it works in a monoculture. Dana heard her brother's voice come back to her clear as a bell. When everything has only one option, only one way means they're all vulnerable to the same weakness. Nothing can last without variety. Dana smiled a bit despite herself. The virus kills the whole network, and the Fringers use the same system for everything to keep the cost down. She felt Morris grip her by the shoulders and lead her to the door. My bike is in the garage level, he whispered in her ears as she freed her hands. He pressed a kiss to the side of her face, though the room was dark enough they couldn't see each other. One day I'll ask you to forgive me he said softly, as she felt him press a plastic ID card into her hand. Dana had her hands free and felt the door controls under her fingers. Fringer network's down right now. That include things like doors and elevators? The door slid open, and Dana let herself breathe as she saw moonlight through one of the tower windows. Stop her! A voice shouted behind her, and Dana was running. The elevator doors closed before anyone could catch her. Morris's ID let her bypass every level between Fringer Central and the garage level. Of course, whoever's coming after me will have the same thing. Through the transparent walls of the elevator, she could see the rest of the tower. It looked normal, almost offensively normal given the life-and-death war going on in the same building. But as Dana passed by one level after another, she couldn't help but notice the subtle differences. The cameras that had been moving constantly on her, on her way in were now still. The guards were working their radios, looking confused at the responses they weren't getting. Some people were complaining to each other that the doors wouldn't unlock for them as they expected. The Fringers were so paranoid about stolen ideas and information being used without payment or rightful access, they put everything they had on the one system purely so they'd never be able to share. Intellectually, she knew this wouldn't last for long. However smart Banner's techies were, the Fringers would also be able to overcome the virus at some point. Likely some point soon. The elevator stopped moving, suddenly. Dana wasn't sure if it was deliberate or part of the malfunction. Without hesitation, Dana took her shoe off and smashed it against the control panel. Made of deco glass rather than anything more solid, it was made to be pretty rather than durable. Dana took a breath and started pulling wires, trying to draw comparisons between her classes out in Arcadia and what she was seeing here. She managed to get the elevator moving again. She saw a second elevator coming down about 30 seconds behind her. Like her own, it was ignoring the other floors. Here they come, Dana bunched her muscles, feeling the adrenaline spike again. I'm gonna have to run. 
The elevator stopped at the sub-level where the garage was. Morris's bike was quickly apparent as it, it was the only vehicle there on two wheels. It was wheeler-made, but she was still wearing Morris's Arcadian jacket over her dress and felt the keys in his pocket. She bolted for the motorcycle and managed to get the thing running just as the elevators opened again and a squad of fringers bolted out, guns drawn. The bike was fast and whisper-quiet, and they barely got a look at her before she skidded up the ramp into the city. As soon as she got outside, she knew she would escape easily. The entire Fringer drone fleet was run from the same command. The patrol drones, the surveillance, all of them had fallen out of the sky. The city was in disbelief as she left the tower, and in total chaos by the time she reached the windbreaks. As those who lived in the city realized that the Fringers were blind for the first time in living memory, the whole town was going absolutely berserk. The Fringers would never be able to follow her, completely outmatched by a population set loose for the first time after generations of repression and starvation. Dana was almost surprised how many people were running for the red line, as if fear of being stopped was the only thing keeping them within the walls. Dana knew that most of them would turn back when thirst or weather got to them. Dana had no supplies and was still wearing her date night dress, but she didn't dare stop at home first. The stars above her were the only advantage, the motorcycle eating the distance until she reached the dunes. After that, progress was slower, but she didn't stop, needing all the distance she could get before the power ran out and the sun came up. Both of those things happened within a few minutes of each other. The hot season was still months away, but Dana was woefully unprepared for the cold, and she was shivering badly. She had to go on foot for the next part of her journey, hoping that she could make her way to a shelter. Well, she'd never make it without warmer clothes. Limping through the dust, the sun helped a little, but eventually she dug herself into dunes to hide from the wind, accepting she'd never reach shelter before she froze. She was getting thirstier, the frosty air demanding her warm breath. She gathered some wild grasses and did her best to start a friction fire. It didn't last long, but the wind eased and she started walking again. Hours passed and the sun started lowering. She knew she'd never survive another night. Her skin was faint blue and her movements were sluggish when she heard the sound of wheels. An Arcadian rig was closing on her and she waved eagerly. As it pulled up alongside her and the door swung open, she realized suddenly it wasn't Dean. It was Banner. For a long heartbeat, they just stared at each other. Finally, he spoke. Somehow the word apology doesn't just doesn't cut it, he admitted and held out a large thermos. She dove on it, taking a long, thirsty drink that almost scalded her mouth. Let's get you inside. <clears throat> oh. I believe this is the last chapter of the book. Let me check. Yep, just chapter 11 and an epilogue is left. <sighs> Let's finish this book off, shall we? Chapter 11. She'd been given a change of clothes and a blanket. As Banner sent a message to Dean, she washed, and the two of them sorted things out while they waited. Dana told him everything she'd experienced since leaving Arcadia. Banner, Banner told her what his investigation had uncovered in her absence. Escalation. Early attacks were just planted explosives. No troops or any real resources involved. Crawley was acting alone, talking up the coming war as best as he could, but he couldn't deploy any actual forces until he took charge of the city. That's why it escalated suddenly. The Fringers weren't soldiers. Dana rasped a bit, speaking between long gulps of soup. Before I left, he was stuck behind Fringer rules, so he worked off book, came to me in person. Once he won the election, he could remake the Fringers into an offensive army. She shivered hard, sensation flowing back into her skin. Was Morris one of your other suspects? No. Suresh was a suspect, but he died refusing to give up what he thought was a valuable Arcadian resource, so he was clear. Watched you break the data card in half unused. That cleared you. He gave her a look. Morris was with you then. Did he know about the data card? No. 
Suresh didn't know it was a trap. Morris apparently went searching for another data card based on your cover story. Where'd he get one? I had nine suspects. Three of those cards are unaccounted for, including the one you just used. Bomb runs and attrition took some of my suspects down. What I can't understand is why Morris didn't give it to his masters right away. Morris was less willing as a turncoat than you might think. My guess is Crawley was planning this for a long time, and his son was making the rounds to a lot of people looking for targets. Somewhere on that mission, he found other things, including the card. That would make that would explain the randomness of the attacks. Never made sense to me because our spy was working for years before the first attack. When we did a test run of 451, the attacks started getting more focused in a hurry. Banner frowned. There's something else. Morris didn't give it to the Fringers himself because, because he wanted something to bargain with for my life. Really did fall for you, huh? I was suspicious about you when I saw you two getting closer and wondered if there was another reason. When he took the blame for the radio and wasn't sure if he was protecting you or protecting himself, hardly mattered since you were both leaving. When you didn't use my Trojan virus, decided you were clean. When I found the radio, I figured I was wrong. But when Morris went out of his way to take the blame for you, I didn't know what to think. Two suspects, neither of whom were taking the bait, both so quick to protect each other. Never occurred to me he might be keeping you in the dark, because I didn't expect you to go back to the city once I realized you were clean. That's a nice way of putting it. Let me try another. When Morris and I were on our way back to the city, we got ambushed. A, a snare for passing motorcycles. The people who caught us were supposed to be iced ferals, but they wanted to know all about New Eden. Now where would they hear that name? Banner winced. That ambush was from you. Couldn't let you tell Crawley where to find Yana or a headquarters. If you could find it on a map, or worse, if you had told Morris already. I had to protect Arcadia, Dana. That's my job. Morris had backup, so close to the red line. My people didn't survive. If Dean never heard from me again, he'd blame the Fringers. Out in the waste, nobody'd ever find a body, Dana thought, but said nothing. Still more interested in the blanket than anything else. Banner let out a sigh, finally breaking the silence himself. Every year, there are more refugees from the city. Set them up in a freehold, show them how to support themselves. It's not the best we can offer, but we can't just let anyone see everything. Dean vouched for you. Morris never made it past the freeholders. That's bad enough. I know. I understand. I trusted Morris so much more than you did. She drained the last of the water. Thing is, even Crawley knows he's, knows he's losing. The city's starving its own people out. Crawley wants war just so that his own people have nowhere to go. They won't give an inch to change their world, and if Morris is your proof that you simply can't let anyone in on faith... Banner winced. Crawley will try again. Yes, he will. So, what's your next move? Dean and Freya arrived soon after, rushing to embrace Dana like they'd been apart for a hundred years. While they waited for Dean to arrive, Banner had worked up a good temper, and he called up Arcadian leadership for a conference call. Yana and Kaelin were visible on his device. Dana, Freya, and Dean all crammed in around him to be present on the call. We have to hit back, Danner, Banner said seriously after he updated them all on the situation. Avoiding and evading their attention was one thing, but now they've decided on a policy of outright exterminating us. we got to find some way to make them pay for it. No, we don't. They tried, they failed, and they'll try again. They'll just try again. Sooner or later, they'll succeed. This doesn't stop until one of us is gone, and it's us or them. They tried to wipe us out, our children, the statics. The statics are dying out! Dana suddenly exploded, loud and fierce enough that everyone listening fell silent. Shy, scared little Dana had just let out a roar. They're shut up in their concrete cities. They can't afford concrete. Their whole system depends on there being no options. The options they have aren't working. Their whole life depends on exploiting people. The people have got nothing left to give. She was breathing hard as, as if saying so had been a marathon. Violence is the only move they have left. If you try to do the same, then you're playing their game on their turf. You'll never win that way. The whole point of Arcadia is that you're not an army, no matter what they call you. Silence rang loud. Wheelers can adapt. Statics can't. The city is a dystopia because they need to feed on each other. 
the Arcadians are a utopia because they help each other. I don't know how you did it, but you've weaponized hope, and it's winning the fight against hunger. Sooner or later, we will be the only ones left. We will, huh? Her brother repeated. Dana stood taller than ever. Yeah. The conversation stalled for a while after Dana's outburst, but it started up again very quickly. Banner had other people to inform, and Dana excused herself to let him speak confidentially with all his people throughout Arcadia. Dana went out into the night, enjoying the sharp, chill air. She'd feared the weather long enough. There were small tufts of wild scrub grass near her feet, and she grinned at it, remembering the valley that Arcadians scattered the seeds in. She didn't even hear Freya coming until she was close enough to give Dana a tight hug. Dean heard half your message before they cut you off. He was climbing the walls trying to get back this way faster. Banner insisted we stay back, just in case you had pursuers. I'm glad you're okay. Banner, indirectly, is the one that got me out, Dana admitted. Oddly enough, we appear to have made peace, she waved back at Banner's rig. What happens now? That's up to Yara and my dad, Freya didn't seem worried. Morris knew a lot, but he didn't know about headquarters or the Valdez. He never visited the Valley Project. The Freeholds, they're the real risk. They can't move on quite as easily as we can. She glanced over at Dana. How are you holding up, really? Dana took a moment to gather her thoughts. Before I came here, there was a guy in the shelters. His name is Magnus. He went feral before I did. I met him here. I met him again here and there. He was at Miller's. I saw him again when the meat was hit by Fringer's troops. He was running to the Fringers, desperate to surrender. He saw them coming, and everything he'd seen out here meant nothing to him because he was scared for his life. She looked over at Freya. I couldn't do that. I should have. City law says you surrender their authority and plead your case. Except I was helping you and the others escape. Freya smothered a smile. You rebel, you. I never told him, Dana whispered. Where to find the valley, where to find headquarters. I'm still learning how to navigate over long distances, but I never told Morris how to find his way to them. I was asked to keep it a secret, and I did. But it wasn't because I didn't trust him, Freya. I know. I would have told him everything if he'd come out and asked. I was... I, I, I trusted him, and I was falling in love with him, and I would have told him everything. Dana was tearing up. Freya hugged her tighter, reassuring. But you didn't. You figured it out. Too late to protect your heart, but in time to save our lives. You did it, Dana. We're safe. Thanks to you. Banner and Dean came out of their meeting an hour later. Dana was already packing some essentials into a duffel bag. So, what's the consensus? We redeploy the network. You were right. We can't play the game by their rules, Dean said as he gestured to the west. On the other side of the continent, there are other static cities ones that aren't nearly so militant against us. There was some talk of building a ship that could use our rides as a power source, but I wouldn't want to try the ocean waves. The outermost freeholds are still out of drone reach. We can move the operations a few hundred miles, sneak back to keep up the work on our forestry stations. And sea farms, they can get put anywhere on the coast, same for the wave generators and desal plants. Dana thought aloud. The trees of the valleys are established enough to keep growing without people, but Morris never saw them. They might be safe. Right now, our operations stretch from Xanadu at this end to HQ at the westernmost spot. If we redeploy everywhere Morris knew about to the other side of HQ, then Yana will be at the center of things rather than the safest outer edge of it. It'll be a disruption, but we'll survive. We always do. And if you do have to set up more sea farms, more plantations, all of them further out, just helps the world to say nothing of anyone who has to abandon the cities after you've left. Agreed. It's the way we do things, to be in so many places they never find us all. He suddenly noticed she was packing. So did Banner. You're not staying? Dana nodded. I can't come with you. I want to, desperately, but I would have to stay in the city. Why? Project 451, the repository. It was a good idea, making sure everyone in the city knows there's another way. Even Crawley was terrified of what could happen if you succeeded. The flaw was delivery. You can't just send information. It's too different for the people who'll be reading it. The statics don't need an illegal encyclopedia. They need a teacher. 
She, her, she spread her hands wide. I'm the repository now, Dean. I'm Project 451. I'm a static who learned the better way. Isn't that the whole point of the plan? Banner stared at her. Dana, they've surely got your picture on every fugitive list in there. I agree, it's a risk, but I've got some friends that'll help, and a few more that don't understand the problem, and I know where to find a bunch of people who are too hungry to care. She held up her notebook. I've been working on my contribution since Miller's scrapyard. In your world, I'm barely an initiate. In the city, I might just be able to do some good. I know enough to find others like us. Dean and Banner traded a look. Banner, you were right. Crawley will try again. I got met at the windbreaks because Dean called first and knew I was coming. If you had someone inside who could vouch for the new people as they run, we could save a lot of lives and build up our numbers. I get the math. I even agree with it. Dean bit his lip. When you first came out of the city, you were... I was a lot like everyone else in the city, but I'm not anymore. There was a long silence as the two men turned this over in their heads. In that time, Dana had set up Dean's printer and was making herself a new motorcycle. A frame was being made as Dean spoke again. It doesn't have to be you. You're really very welcome to stay. You've done more than your time inside the red line. Dana hesitated and looked at Banner. You agree? He nodded, not meeting her eyes at first. We owe you everything. We could have lost three quarters of our wheelers, and with them, the supply lines between the projects. If we'd lost that one, and taken years to build back what we lost, and if Iana's right about a limited ice age... You know the projects aren't going to work, right? Dana said seriously. I get the point of them. They may just save human existence, giving us places to go when the weather comes to stay, but they'll never fix the world. What they will do is save lives. That's another reason why it has to be me. I have people I need to save. Dean's head tilted. You're so sure they can't do it after everything you've seen? We're working under constant siege in one reason, region of the whole world. I don't claim to be an expert, but I know the climate's global, and we're certainly not. Dean gave a questioning look to Banner, who let out a long sigh, finally nodding permission. Dean grinned and gestured for Dana to come closer, pulling out his screen. Dana looked and saw that her brother had called up the region map. With a few taps on the display, many more icons filled in, some to mark the wheelers, some to mark the city forces, some to mark the projects. Then Banner leaned over and tapped his passwords, and the city zoomed out, showing more of the region, then more of the continent. Other city-states flashed up on the scene, most of them much larger than the one she knew, along with hundreds of projects, hundreds of colonies, maybe thousands of wheelers. The map kept zooming out until Dana could see the curve of the earth, and everywhere she looked she saw more people like her, deep in the continents, away from the cities, out in the oceans, where nobody'd even notice without a map, far north, far south, and spreading outward from all the Arcadian icons there was greenery. The world was turning green right in front of her, one icon at a time. Dana felt her throat close up. My God. Dean was grinning at her triumphantly. Sushan was just the first one locally. Arcadia's global. Has been for longer than we've been alive. They didn't know that anyone had survived the heat waves on this continent, let alone the big storms. By the time they knew, the cities had claimed everything at gunpoint, but there are places in the world where Arcadia is running the show. Whole countries that have what Eden has. The damage was extreme, but we're a workforce of millions working around the clock all across the world. City isn't just isolationist, it's almost insignificant on the world scale. The fight between Arcadia and the city is heating up, but the world's already been decided. Why haven't they helped us? How? Oh, by starting a war? It's just not as much communication with the rest of them as you think. We don't work for them, we're just all allied in our goals. Crawley couldn't have stopped the future if he burned the region down. Sooner or later, the city will fall the same way the rest of the old thinking did. He smiled, enjoying the look on her face. Welcome to Arcadia, Dana. Alright, let's dive into the epilogue and finish this book off. Dana had been first forced to leave the city because she felt like it was too risky to use a fake ID like Micah. 
She wasn't afraid anymore, and once she had the ID, everything else was so automated, Dana was practically invisible. Nobody ever looked each other in the eye anymore. It was eager, easier to bankrupt them that way. The Fringers came looking for Dana at the family home, but Micah owned it now, and Dana hadn't lived there for a year. By the time they stopped looking, Dana had a new name, a new look, and was now a legally paying boarder, hiding in plain sight. Dana's home had a lengthy drain pipe that had rusted a few holes. Dana had never bothered with the garbage fees to have it taken away, and so a little elbow grease had cleaned it up and turned it into a single, passable arrow farm tube, just like the one Dean had in his rig. Dana had cut up the plastic wrapper of her protein packs to make a serviceable basket for a seed to grow in, and she'd scrounged some gravel to hold the seedling upright. Marco had taught her well on how to improvise a simple pump mechanism. The kitchen pantry was deeper than her groceries ever reached. Dean had given her a small bottle of nutrient concentrate and a few LED lights, which took little power, even by the rigorous standards of the city utilities. So, behind her few foodstuffs, there was now a sealed compartment that grew a small crop of strawberry hybrids, grown from the tiniest of seeds, thoughtfully contributed from Freya's aero farm. Dana was expecting her first har harvest of a dozen fresh strawberries in less than a month. On the black market, they'd be worth enough for her to start a few projects of her own. She wasn't the only one in the city to know of a hidden, unnoticed spot where things could grow. Micah was terrified of the knowledge Dana had given her, but the instant Dana had presented her with rose petals, she was hooked, feeling the silky thing between her calloused fingers constantly. She was homesick for the place Dana had described. So was her child, sick with longing for the colorful beauty the city denied. Eli's little crush on Dana had not lessened with her transformation. He was in awe of her and hungry to redeem himself for the part he'd played during the attack. Dana had no doubts he'd be loyal to the cause, or at least to her. Dana had directed them to find at least two other people who could be trusted, who craved the same things that Dana had seen. Finding unobserved space in the city was tricky, but Dana was fast learning the difference between unobserved and simply ignored for being unprofitable. The group had started with three and become seven. Dana told them, their sto told them her story and answered their questions. They had questions she couldn't answer, but they all wanted to come back for more. By the end of the second week, Dana had taught them how to build a condenser or how to hide urban gardens. They'd salvaged enough, they'd salvaged enough electronic equipment to build a pirate antennae, and they made contact with Dean, who had far more to teach. By the end of the fourth week, their group had grown to twelve, and Dana made them a promise. The, the time's going to come when even the most jaded Fringer can't keep their head in the sand and pretend everything will keep on spinning as it always has. When that day comes, we'll leave the city. Some of you may leave sooner than that, and I'll make sure there's someone to meet you on the other end. She smiled warmly at them. For all the things you've learned in the last month, we're just playing with the ideas. Out there, it's a lifestyle. Dear Dean, Micah asked if her child could be smuggled from the city to join you as an apprentice. I'd vouch for him, and given his age, you can be pretty sure he's not a spy. I hope Micah isn't counting herself out of going, too. It'll be hell for her to send her baby away even to save him. I don't remember if I ever told you this, but just before I came to join you, I was on a work detail. Me and a bunch of others from the shelter, we were doing some maintenance out at the storm memorial when someone noticed a dandelion poking up through the concrete. It was a weed. But the, foreman on our, but the foreman on our work detail was staring at it like an enemy and invader. He was horrified to see it alive and growing because he knew that greenery was the most, only the most visible part. He knew that all the roots were underneath. And because of that, it would just keep pushing. Once that little flower reached daylight, it was a huge job to kill it. Just by making it that far, it had already made a gap in the concrete and the light and the rain would pour forever down to the roots and break apart the pavement bit by bit. He said, there's a point where all this just keeps rolling. I actually forgot about that for a long time, but today I saw another weed poking up through the concrete. One way or another, life wins out. The weeds are winning against the walls. A perfect metaphor for Arcadia if there ever was one, which is why we were lucky to get the dandelions first. I'm harvesting the seeds and planting them wherever I can in the concrete. I hope all is well out there and that you're busy with the best kind of work. In the meantime, 
It's been wonderful to find the others. I'm not alone here anymore. All my love, Dana. That is a that is a fantastic end to this book, and now I'm sitting here looking, like I have, not in this room, but I have access to a bunch of uh, hydroponic supplies. That now I'm very tempted to like, scrounge some stuff together. Like I have a couple things around that would work. I'm like, oh man, I've been meaning to garden anyway. And like we've got some seeds around. I'm actually waiting on uh, a library book about gardening in this area specific climate because like i'm so used to you know the midwestern climate in gardening that i don't want to jump in with both feet out here and find that i cannot <laughs> grow things i want to have a little more information but oh that was a great book i really enjoyed that let's read a little about the author matt stevens lives in australia with his family he writes more as a personal passion than a profession, but his bibliography covers novels, short stories, plenty of online writings, even some podcast audio dramas. He plans on getting a personal life at some point, but this is a low priority for now. More information about his previous and future releases can be found in the links on his Amazon author page. Uh, and then there are the footnotes that we've all read previously. You know, I never did look into uh, into uh, kite generators, but that is very interesting. That's something that that was like a huge blind spot coming into this. Like some of this I knew, and some of this I knew you could use at large, but I did not know you could do kite generators. And I wonder how much use a kite generator's design would be in like interacting with tidal force, for example. But I digress. The, this book was really, really good. Uh, I've been reading a lot of solar punk lately, and I think that this is uh, this is a book that's super, super good to to hand someone as like a first solar punk book. In no small part because it's about Dana understanding the way the way that you can so easily approach things like that like it, it's it's so simple to just go oh yeah i'll just grow something in our day and age anyway and so like i don't know it just feels like a really great one to hand someone for like their first solar punk book like i i've been reading like i said i've been reading a lot of solar punk off stream uh, a lot a lot of work by Becky Chambers, um, Phoebe Wagner, um, and I don't know. There's been a lot of stuff that I'm reading. I'm like, wow, this is really good, but I don't know if I could hand this to someone as like their first solar punk book. This one, I think, would work really well as like an introductory, uh, an introductory novel to hand someone to understand the genre, or even uh, Miles Past Xanadu, honestly. I think would work really, really well. Like, hand them Miles Past Xanadu and go, okay, if you like this, read the whole book. If you like the whole book, read uh, read this, read that, read this. I've got a couple recommendations I could make. Obviously, uh, I called out Becky Chambers as an author earlier. Um, Becky Chambers wrote, uh, wrote a prayer for the, uh, a psalm for the Wild Bill, uh, which kind of, sets itself in a post solar punk world where or a, po a post climate apocalypse world where uh well less post climate apocalypse essentially uh all of the robots that were doing all of our work experienced the singularity and ran into the wilds and people went hmm what if we rebuilt better and so uh a psalm for the wild build and a prayer for the crown shy uh kind of follow the journey of someone who has become disillusioned with their previous role in this solar punk society and moves on from what they were doing to be a tea monk uh which is essentially like a traveling therapist it's really really great i would suggest if you liked wheelers first of all if you liked wheelers i'd suggest uh complaining to your local library and seeing if they have it 
and uh, if not, uh, maybe see once if they can get it. Or uh, if you really, really like the wheelers, I'd say go back and read Miles Past Xanadu because it actually expands uh, all of the footnotes that we saw in the book. Um, the corresponding scenes from Miles Past Xanadu have similar footnotes that actually link directly sources. Uh, so I'd really, really suggest if you liked this, uh, give Miles Past Xanadu a look. Let me link that again. Miles Past Xanadu, the complete short story. Uh, if you really liked this, I would heartily suggest Miles Past Xanadu. It's it's essentially the short story version of this, and it's it's so good. It really made me fall in love with this whole thing. Uh, where is the Amazon link? I had it around here somewhere. Ah, Wheelers, here we are. Uh, Wheelers, you can buy on Amazon. Uh, I will link that actually, and it will be in the show notes. I'd heartily suggest it. Um, there is a way to buy this outside of Amazon, but it's kind of uh, physical only. Um, uh, Thrift Books is the... Ah, bookshop.org. That's the company I was talking about earlier that kind of lets you set... Yeah, it lets you choose a bookstore and uh, gives them a little bit of a kickback from when you're selling your book, when you're buying a book. Uh, so you can essentially shop in your local bookstore online. So uh, remind me, this is the bookshop.org link I just put in chat uh, for Wheelers in particular. Obviously the paperback version is the only one open, uh, available. I don't, I honestly don't know much about buying ebooks outside of uh, Amazon's purview, which is kind of wild to me, like with how many ebooks I read all the time. But like, I also wind up getting ebooks from my library a lot. So that's kind of been my path to ebooks that doesn't directly involve Amazon, if you're not an Amazon person. Um,. Do we have enough time for another thing? We got like what? Three minutes? Ten minutes? We got like ten minutes. Let me look at the next issue. Uh, September, January, February, March, August, September. Let me look at the September issue of Astounding Stories and see how long the first short story in it is. Because if we've got enough time, I might just grab some water and read that to polish this off, but long story short, uh, that was that was uh, how long is this? Oh, this is a this is a part, this is a uh, how long are you? Do, 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 do. This is way too long for this right now. Oh no, no. Well, uh, we could we could just read one of the parts actually. Hang on, because this is in this is not serialized. There are just parts to the story. Uh, you know what? Hang on, hang on. Oh yeah, we can get through part one at least. Let me grab some water super quickly and then we will get we will dive into this just real quick. Uh, let me just add this to the screen. Notice that it is very small, make it larger. 
I will be right back. Nobody explode. Um, and we will just read ourselves a little short story and then call it a night, huh? Everyone behave. I just need water real quick. Okay, let's, let us finish out the night, shall we, and uh, read a little bit from the September issue of Astounding Stories of Super Science. We are reading A Problem in Communication by Miles J. Brenner, or Brewer? Hang on a second. Is that an A? I swear I'm losing my mind. Yeah, it's a U. It was just in a funky font. A Problem in Communication by Miles J. Brewer, M.D. Part 1. The Science Community. This part is related by Peter Hagstrom, Ph.D. The ability to communicate ideas from one... Uh, the ability to communicate ideas from one individual to another said a professor of sociology to his class, is the principal distinction between human beings and their brutish forebears. The increase and refinement of this ability to communicate is an index of the civilization, degree of civilization of a people. The more civilized a people, the more perfect their ability to communicate, especially under difficulties and in emergencies. As usual, the observation burst harmlessly over the heads of most of the students in the class who were preoccupied with more immediate things, uh, the evening's movies and the weekend's dance. But upon two young men in the class, it made a powerful impression. It crystallized within them certain vague conceptions and brought them to a conscious focus, enabling the young men to turn formless dreams into concrete acts. That is why I take the position that the above enthusiastic words of the sociology professor, whose very name I've forgotten, were the prime moving influence from which many years later succeeded in saving Occidental civilization from a catastrophe which would have been worse than death and destruction. Now there's an illustration. The delivery of his country into the clutches of a merciless ultra-modern religion can be prevented only by Dr. Hagstrom's deciphering an extraordinary code. One of these young men was myself, and the other was my lifelong friend and chum, Carl, Bre Carl Benda, who saved his country by solving a tremendously difficult scientific puzzle in a simple way, by sheer reasoning power and without apparatus. The sociology professor struck a responsive chord in us, for since our earliest years we had wigwagged to each other as boy scouts, learned the finger alphabet of the deaf and dumb so that we might maintain communication during school hours, strung a telegraph wire between our two homes, admires po admired Poe's gold bug together, and devised boyish cipher codes in which to send each other postcards when chance separated us, but... We'd always felt a little foolish about what we considered our childish hobbies until the professor's words suddenly roused us to the re realization we were a highly civilized pair of youngsters. Not only then and there did we fe cease feeling guilty about our secret ciphers and our dots and dashes, but the determination was born within us to make communication our life's work. It turned out that both of us actually did devote our lives to the cause of communication, but... The passing years saw us engaged in widely and curiously divergent phases of the work. Thirty years later, I was professor of the psychology, uh, professor of the psychology of language at Columbia University, 
and Benda was a maintenance engineer on the Bell Telephone Company in New York. And on his knowledge and skill depended the continuity and stability of that stupendously complex traffic, the telephone communication of greater New York. Since our ambitious cravings were satisfied in our everyday work, and since now ordinarily available methods of communication sufficed our needs, we no longer felt impelled to signal across the housetops with semaphores, nor to devise ciphers that would defy solution. But we still kept up our intimate friendship and our intense interest in our beloved subject. We were just as close chums at the age of fifty as we had been at ten, and just as thrilled at new advances in communication at television, at international language, at the supposed signals from Mars. Hang on, let me, uh... Yeah, figured I should update my title so it's not... Doesn't look like I'm still reading Wheelers. Oh. D -d 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 signals from Mars, that's where we were. And that was the state of affairs between us up to a year ago. At about that time, Bender resigned his position with the New York Bell Telephone Company to accept a place as the Director of Communication in the Science Community. This, for many reasons, was a most amazing piece of news to myself and to anyone who knew Benda. Of course, it was commonly known that Benda was being sought by universities and corporations. I know personally of several tempting offers he had received, but the New York Bell, it's a wealthy corporation, and had thus far managed to hold Benda, both by the munificence of its salary and by the attractiveness of the work it offered him. That the science community would want Benda was easy to understand, but that it could outbid the New York Bell was, to say the least, a surprise. Furthermore, um, that a man like Benda would want to have anything at all to do with the science community seemed strange enough in itself. He had the most practical common sense, well-balanced habits of thinking and living, supported by an intellect so clear and so keen that I knew of none to excel it. What the science community was, no one knew exactly, but there was something abnormal fanatical about it that no one doubted. Uh, the science community, for context here, uh, for the listener, science community is capitalized, capital S, capital C, science community. The science community, situated in Virginia in the foothills of the Blue Ridge, had first been heard of many years ago when it was an already a going concern. At the time of which I now speak, the novelty had worn off, and no one paid any more attention to it than they do to Zion City or the drunkards. The dunkards, rather. I know neither of those things. Those sound contemporary to the 30s. That's a Google question for me later. By this time, the science community was a city of a million inhabitants with a vast outlying area of farms and gardens. It was modern to the highest degree in construction and operation. There was very little manual labor there, no poverty. Every person had all the benefits of modern developments in power, transportation, and communication, and all of the other resources provided by scientific progress. So much, visitors and reporters were able to say. The rumors that it was a vast socialistic organization without private property, with equal sharing of all privileges, well, that, were never, that was never confirmed. It is a curious observation that it was possible in this country of ours for a city to exist about which we knew so little. However, it seemed evident from the vast number and elaboration of public buildings, the perfection of community utilities such as transportation, streets, lighting, and communication, uh, from the absence of individual homes and the housing of people in huge dormitories, that some different, 
less individualistic type of social organization than ours was involved. It was obvious that as an organization, the science community must also be wealthy. If any of its individual citizens were wealthy, no one knew it. I knew Benda as well as I knew myself, and if I was sure of anything in my life, it was that he was not the type of man to leave a $50,000 job and join a communist community on an equal footing with the clerks in the stores. As it happens, I was also intimately acquainted with John Edgewater Smith, recently power commissioner of New York City and the most capable power tower engineer in North America, who, following Benda by two or three months, resigned his position and accepted what his letter termed the place of director of power in the science community. I was personally in a position to state that neither of these men could be lightly persuaded into such a step, and neither of them would work for a small salary besides. Benda's first letter to me stated that he was at the science community on a visit. He had heard of the place, and while on Washington on while at Washington on business, had taken advantage of the opportunity to drive out and see it. Fascinated by the equipment he saw there, he decided to stay a few days and study it. The next letter pronounced his acceptance of the position. I'd give a month's salary to get a look at those letters now, but uh, I neglected pre to preserve them. I should like to see them. I'm curious as to whether they exhibit the characteristics of the subsequent letters, some of which I now have. As I've stated, Ben and I had been on the most intimate terms for forty years. His letters had always been crisp and direct, thoroughly familiar, confidential. I did not know just how many letters I received from him from the science community before I noted the difference, but I have one from the third month of his stay there, he wrote every two or three weeks, characterized by a verbosity that sounded strange for him. He seemed to be writing merely to cover the sheet, trifles such as he had never previously considered worth writing letters about. Four pages of letter conveyed not a single idea. Yet Benda was, if anything, a man of ideas. There followed several months of letters like that, a lot of words, evasion of coming to the point about anything, just conventional letters. Benda was the last man to write a conventional letter, yet it was Benda writing them. Rough little expressions of his, clear ways of looking at even the various trifles, little allusions to our common past. These things could neither have been written by anyone else, nor have been written under compulsion from without. Something, something had changed Benda. I pondered on it a good deal and could think of no hypothesis to account for it. In the meanwhile, New York City lost a third technical man to the science community. Donald Francisco, commissioner of the water supply, a sanitary engineer of international standing, accepted a position in the science community as water director. I do not know whether to laugh and compare it to the National Baseball League's trafficking big names or to hunt for some sinister disaster sign in it. But as a result of my ponderings, I decided to visit Benda at the science community. I wrote to him to that effect, and almost decided to change my mind about the visit because of the cold evasiveness of the reply I had received from him. My first impulse on reading his indifferent, lackadaisical comment on my proposed visit was to feel offended and determine, him, and determine to let him alone and never see him again. Well, the average man would have done that, but my long years of training in psychological interpretation told me that a character and a friendship built during forty years doesn't change in six months. There must be some other explanation for this. I wrote him that I was coming. I found that the best way to reach the science community was to take a bus out from Washington. It involved a drive of about fifty miles northwest through a picturesque section of the country. The latter part of the drive took me past settlements that looked as though they might be in the same stage of progress as they'd been since the American Revolution. The city of my destination was back in the hills and very much isolated. During the last ten miles, we met no traffic at all. I was the only passenger left in the bus. Suddenly, the vehicle stopped. As we go, the driver shouted. I looked about in consternation. All around were low, wild-looking hills. The road went on ahead through a narrow pass. They'll pick you up in a little bit, the driver said as he turned around and drove off, leaving me standing there with my bag very much astonished at it all. He was right. The small, neat-looking bus drove through the pass and stopped for me. 
As I got in, the driver mechanically turned around and drove into the... As I got in, the... Me, the oh. One more time. As I got in, the driver mechanically turned around and drove into the into the hills again. They took up my t uh, they took up my ticket on the other bus. I said to the driver, "What do I owe you?" "Nothing," he said curtly. "Fill that out." He handed me a card. An impertinent thing that card was. Besides asking for my name, address, nationality, vocation, and position, it requested that I state whom I was visiting in the science community. The purpose of my visit, the nature of my business, how long I intended to stay, did I have a place to stay arranged for, if so, where and through whom, looked for all the world as though they had something to conceal. Czarist Russia couldn't beat that for keeping track of people and trying into their business. Sign here, the card said. Oh, it certainly annoyed me, but I filled it out, and by the time I was through, the bus was out of the hills, traveling up the valley of a small river. I'm not familiar enough with Northern Virginia to say which river it was. There was much machinery and a few people in the broad fields, and the distance ahead was a few uh, was a mass of chimneys and a couple of ironworks, but no smoke. There were power line towers with high tension insulators, and far ahead the masses of huge elevators and big square buildings. Soon I came in sight of a veritable veritable forest of huge windmills. In a few moments, the huge buildings loomed up over me. The bus entered a street of the city abruptly from the country. One moment on a country road, the next moment among towering buildings. We sped along swiftly through a busy metropolis that was bright, airy, and efficient-looking. The traffic was dense, but quiet. I was confident most of the vehicles were electric. There was no noise, no gasoline odor. Nor was there any smoke. Things looked airy, comfortable, efficient but rather monotonous and dull. There was a total lack of architectural interest. The buildings, they were just square blocks, like neat rows of neat boxes. But it all moved smoothly, quietly, with wonderful efficiency. My first thought was to look closely at the people who swarmed the streets of this strange city. Their faces were solemn and their clothes were solemn. All seemed intently busy, going somewhere, doing something. There was no standing about, no idle sauntering. And whichever way I might, whichever way I might look, everywhere there was the same blue surge on men and women alike, in all directions, as far as I could see. The bus stopped before a neat square building of rather smaller size, and the next thing I knew, Benda was running down the steps to meet me. He was his old, gruff, enthusiastic self. Glad to see you, Hankstrom, old socks, he shouted and gripped my hand with two of his. I've arranged for a room for you. you will have to have a good old visit. I'll show you around the town. I looked at him closely. He looked healthy and well cared for, all except for a couple new lines of worry on his face. Undoubtedly, that worn look meant some sort of trouble. Hang on, let me see how long this is. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll pick up with part two of this. Uh, next time we have a uh, little time we need to fill at the tail end of an episode. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave you on the delightful cliffhanger about this, well, quite literally astounding story of super science. Uh, we'll come back to this issue of astounding just as soon as we have time. In the meanwhile, uh... In the meanwhile, dear listener, I really hope you enjoyed our story. Once again, uh, the link to the story we were reading, uh, finishing up tonight, uh, Wheelers by Matt Stevens, is going to be in the show notes or in the description, depending on where you're ac accessing it. Uh, regardless of all that, uh, come back next week. We will be returning to Public Domain Fair. Uh, we still have a few more books in the uh, on the docket, as it were, uh, that are here by author permission. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to pick up a few more things from the public domain. Uh, we will come back next week with that. Um, I'm hoping to stay on the solar punk theming. Uh, all that said, uh, check the show notes. There's there's a good there's a good volume of stuff in there that I think people haven't been interacting with very much that I think you'll find very interesting. Like say a Discord or a note that this is all recorded live. Uh, 
or access to the book that we've been reading. Uh, but I digress. And this has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't sting.